and uh, I would welcome you to this afternoon's Public Accounts Committee. Members' mobile phones must be set to airplane mode on silent or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The meeting is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed live via online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Um, item 1 of the agenda is apologies. Have we any apologies? No apologies. Item 2, minutes of the meeting of the 2nd of July that are pages 7 to 11 of your meeting pack. Uh, members have a look at those and uh, there's a slight amendment to the minutes as the meeting was held in room 115, not the Senate, which has now been amended. Uh, apart from that, are members uh, content and happy for me to sign? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. <clears throat> Items. Item three is matters arising. Any matters arising from those minutes? Okay. Item four then, declaration of members' interests. Members at each of the meetings, you are required to register your relevant financial and other interests in the register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr Muir. Thank you. I would declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink and okay. a member of Orange and North Down Borough Council. Okay, also, my stepfather is a quality manager on the A6, don't give him bypass. You were? No, my stepfather. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> 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 um, Mr. McHugh. And uh, I'm a member of the Common Luke Scale Scaler, GAA. All oh, right, okay. Um, agenda item five correspondence are at pages 14 and 15 of your meeting pack. Members are referred to page 15 of your pack. Uh, the letter dated the 12th of June 2020 from Tracy Mahard, the accounting officer for the Department of uh, Communities, in response to the R letter of the 28th of May 2020. Uh, on clarity for why the contingent liability was required for the scheme to provide the priority slots um, during COVID-19. I think it was Mr O'Toole who has just arrived awesome. and raised that issue. Um, are members content, content. with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, members, we will then continue in public session. Item six in your pack is the public accounts uh, report on the access votes 20 uh, 2016-17, pages 1 <coughs> to 13 of your table pack. Uh, we're joined this afternoon by Mr Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland, and Mr Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer. And uh, Tomas joining us? No. Okay. Um, so at last week's meeting of the Public Accounts Meeting uh, Committee, with the committee discussed in some detail the draft report on access votes 2016-17, and uh, those due to the broadcasting limitations of room 115. Members uh, agreed to revisit the access uh, report in public session at today's meeting. Can I just say, members, at last meeting, we asked the clerk and the controller Auditor general prepare a paragraph to be inserted into the report to reflect the issues raised by the committee. And I refer you to the report and the additional paragraphs that are highlighted in the uh, uh, table pack. Mr Donnelly, would you like to take us through the additional paragraphs in more detail? Uh, the like first, first of all, good afternoon. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, but really, members had raised a couple of points, and uh, the first one was just, uh, I suppose, on the scale of the, the excesses. Uh, they're not extraordinary, but uh, I've added a, a paragraph uh, just to say the scale of some of the excesses suggests us that there's room for greater precision in budget setting, and we note the Comptroller and Auditor General is currently conducting a separate investigation into the operation of the budgetary process in Northern Ireland, uh, and we look forward to the outcome of this work. Uh, that work is currently in hand, and when it's complete, I can brief the committee separately on it. Okay. Um, the second point was just uh, explanations for some of the, the more significant variances, and uh, probably one of the, the, the biggest one was um, the excess in the Department of the Economy. So uh, the suggested extra paragraph uh, is, and I, I read it into the sure. record here if that's fine. Uh, the excess was mainly due to an increase in the notional student loan subsidy. Uh, £51 million pounds in brackets, 
an additional expenditure on the RHI scheme, 27 million. Uh, so that accounts for the lion's share of the, the, the increase. Okay. Um, have any members any questions on the uh, information that Mr. Donnelly has provided for us? And so it is in your table pack. We had a lengthy discussion around the issue last week, but today we need to formally ratify. Any members any questions or comments? Members content? Mr. Donnelly? Uh, just one final point. Uh, that paragraph I read out uh, is a substitute for another paragraph that's in the report that probably will not make much sense to you. So that, that's the revised paragraph. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so if um, members have no questions, comments, and are content. Um, members, therefore, can I put the question, are you agree, content to agree uh, the 2016-17 access vote reports with the additional paragraphs added? And if you are now content, a copy of the amended 2016-17 access votes report will go to the Finance Committee and the TOA uh, in advance of the main estimates and the Budget Number 3 Bill to be introduced to the Assembly in September. The passing of the Budget uh, Act will then authorise the additional <coughs> grant by the Assembly to regularise the excesses incurred by departments. Members, if you are content with the amended 2016-17 PAC access votes report, uh, we will be led in the Assembly Business Office, and a statement of the access uh, can be then presented to the Assembly uh, to be voted on into the Budget. Are members content? Great. 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 Thank you. Okay, members, we um, will remain in public session um, and in, we will move to evidence on the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on the major capital works at pages 18 to 125. At this stage, I propose that we take a slight adjournment to allow the room to be set up for our new uh, guests. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, members, we are now back in public session, uh, and uh, Mr. Donnelly and Mr. Bingham uh, will remain with us for the first evidence session, uh, which is on the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on major capital works at pages 18 to 125 of the meeting pack. Uh, members, due to the limitations of the room and social distancing, I would uh, be proposing, I think, as we agreed last week, that the witnesses. Uh, will be taken in two slots. Um, uh, I refer you to the witness biographies of all the witnesses in your meeting pack, pages 112 to 114, for information purposes. Members in advance uh, is the uh, audit team to answer any relevant questions uh, members may have during the session, and also in attendance is Stuart Stevenson, TOA, and Julie Searle, uh, an official from the TOA, who are also available to ask any questions. Members, for this briefing, you have the following papers in your meeting pack. Uh, for reference, I refer to the pages in your meeting pack. The Northern Ireland Audit Office Report on Major Capital Works, pages 18 to 111. Previous correspondence from Chris Murphy, dated the 22nd of May uh, 2020, from Katrina Godfrey, the uh, Accounting Officer of the Department for Infrastructure, regards A5 and A6, at pages 115 to 123. A letter dated the 24th of June from Katrina Godfrey, Accounting Officer, Department of Infrastructure, regarding evidence session the 8th of July 
2020 at pages 124 to 125 and papers from last week's preparation session in your confidential packs, pages 19 to 24. Could we possibly have uh, Ms Maharg and Jacqueline Fearon? Thank you. Members, our first um, guests today are Ms. Tracy Mahark, uh, Accounting Officer, Permanent Secretary for the Department of Communities, and Ms. Jacqueline Fearon, Head of Capital Delivery for the Department of Communities. Good afternoon, ladies. You're very welcome. Um, can I, before I ask members if they have any questions, do, would either of you like to make any uh, introductory comments or statement? Just very briefly, if I may. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, um, I, I really appreciated the fact that this was delayed from, from March because we've been very busy during that period addressing COVID-19. Um, and I know that actually the background to this is all very well set out in the case study nine. So I'm not going to go into details on that, just to remind us all that um, it was in 2009 when the decision was made not to have a multi-stadium. Uh, multi 2011, um, the executive endorsed the budget of 110 million. Um, and also the uh, sub-regional, uh, 36.2 million. Two of the stadium are complete. Um, they're both operational and delivering as planned um, with significant community, social uh, and employment benefits. Um, there's no doubt that delivery of Casement Park Stadium, as it said um, in the report, there's been serious delays on that. And the, the report also recognises that there are the reasons for those serious delays in terms of the JR, the redesign, safety issues, and the complexity. Um, 2015, there was a PAR which really reset the programme. Turning to sub-regional, just to say that this programme has also been subject to significant delays. Um, much of that down to the fact that there wasn't a way forward agreed before the assembly collapsed. But I would say that DFC officials are currently engaging with the sector uh, in the development of detailed implementation plans. Um, that was really all I had to say um, in advance, and I'm very happy to take questions. Okay. Um, if members could indicate when they're keen to ask questions. I'll just bring you in a second, Mr. Hildage. Can I just say, um, we, we did take a decision as a committee, absolutely cognizant of the fact that you and your colleagues would have been dealing with hugely important and critical um, life-threatening decisions in relation to COVID, and that's why we decided not to have uh, those meetings uh, in, the, in, the, in what we believe was in the public interest. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, and thank you very much for your uh, opening statement. Mr Hildage. Thanks, Chair. And ladies, you're very welcome. And indeed, I would add to the, the Chair's congratulations as to how you have been working through that period of time. And I know working on the ground in my own constituency, what has been supplied by the Department of Communities has been very welcome indeed amongst our honourable people. So thank you for that. On, on the Casement Park uh, situation, obviously there was an application made in uh, 2013, I think, and that was passed, but then there was the, the Judiciary Review, which obviously squashed the application. There was a very high degree of expertise within the department at that particular time, and that expertise seemed to be ignored, for the want of a better terminology. That expertise was sought after through other parts of the UK and was involved in very similar planning applications. And I know one in Brighton springs to mind, and there's a few others around the UK as well. How come that expertise within the department, uh, Scott and I, was, was ignored for so long? Um, so, what I will refer to in terms of my evidence is the examination of that through the project assessment review that was done after it. Um, it would appear that um, there were weaknesses in terms of 
uh, how issues were escalated um, between the STG and the Programme and Project Board. Um, the uh, power of that period obviously was done by an independent assessor and brought in significant um, technical expertise. Um, the view was that um, the, because casement was much more complex, actually, the experience in Northern Ireland of dealing with a stadium of that size was actually not as well developed as we would have liked. Um, and the, one of the recommendations from that power was that, um, that that expertise is developed in Northern Ireland and there was a complete resetting then of the STG, the Safe, Safety Technical Group, after that. Um, the other issue is in the power review, which is quite clear, is that the words it used was the relationships were broken. Now, I think all of us recognise that um, when relationships are not operating well, communications very often break down as well. So a combination of factors in terms of casement was a much more complex project than the other two stadium. Um, Northern Ireland hadn't, didn't have the, hadn't had the expertise in the past of addressing that. Uh, relationships had broken down. And I know the Cal Committee at the time had a lot of conflicting views on that. My own view on that is that actually probably everybody that came in and said what they said it was their interpretation of what was happening at that time, but the, the power review is quite clear that that needed to be, to be reset, and I'm very comfortable that it was. Um, indeed, to the extent that the uh, engagement with the, um, the UK body, um, the safety ground... SGSS, uh, safety ground... Uh, um, ...was actively involved uh, in the project, and, and um, indeed, um, some of the work that was done around the revised project definition um, is seen as best practice in terms of international terms, particularly um, in terms of exiting outside of the stadium. So I think there are lessons to be learnt there for us. Um, but I would say that the really important thing now <coughs> is that safety has been at the absolute heart of the redevelopment of Casement. It's also a pity that that expertise was then lost mm -hmm. to Northern Ireland, basically, as well, by people taking up other rules and other jurisdictions and that, which was a, fit, a great pity, to be honest. So I, I think any expertise loss is... is a, it, but, but I would say that I, I'm, I'm also being assured that actually new expertise has been developed. Um, so one of the issues was about recognising that capability development. Um, so the, the um, STG was taken to look at best practice and I do believe now that we have better expertise in Northern Ireland in a wider range of people. They report it was all very much residing in a very small number of people before. So um, I think expertise is, is probably more broadly um, based now. Uh, just a pity it took that for the, the delay that involved with the stadium. Uh, communication with the residents then, how has it developed since then? And I know, I know elected representatives for that area must, they're obviously pushing to get if it was my area, I'd be pushing to get the development as well. But how was the residents within that area, who were very vociferous about their human rights and whatnot, and how it was all being impinged upon them there? Yes, indeed. Um, the, um, following the um, JR, so I should say that even before the JR, there had been resident engagement. Uh, clearly, the residents did not feel that was adequate. Um, and casement attracts you know, very strong passions in people, either for or against. Mm -hmm. And um, following the JR decision, um, there was a very significant um, engagement with local residents um, over a 32-week period. Um, indeed, quite a, quite a lot of the redesign and the time um, taken to do that mm -hmm. was down to that engagement with the residents. So what they attempted to do was really understand what the issues were in terms of things like the light, um, the traffic congestion, um, the noise, um, and those, those issues were all redesigned into the, into the new um, placement. Um, it's, 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 it's clear and it's on record that some residents still believe, have, have stated, that they wouldn't, they're, they, they, they're not happy with that size of a stadium. Um, and it will be up to the planning to take account of all of the issues in there in terms of balancing the 
development of state, state casement socio-economic benefits against the rights of the, the, the local residents. Did the department ever have a look at an alternative venue within the county or within the Belfast area to try and achieve what the association wanted to do? So the just so that so whilst the department is responsible for delivering the project, the way the project's delivered, all three projects were delivered through the sporting codes. So in two thousand and nine um, after the decision was made not to have a multi-complex, uh, um, the, the department that, that then went out to the sporting codes and asked them for their proposals. Um, and it was the sporting codes that came back with the proposals about where they would be built. The basement um, was always larger, um, and the reason for that was to, to, to be a regional stadium. It has to actually have a certain number of people that can attend. Um, so it's the it's the GAA's decision that that, that and that was that was agreed in the um, original SOC OBC. Um, so in the OBC, there was a range of options looked at, and the three stadium that were uh, identified were deemed to be <coughs> the most economically and uh, advantageous. So um, that's it. Probably would have been built by now and operational for a couple of years. I'm sure. Well, I mean. That, that, that was that was how it got to the uh, yes. to, to, to work to where it is today. Uh, within the new budget, then the, what the optimum bias within the budget? How much is being allowed for that? So the the way optimum bias works, obviously, is you expect at the early stages of the project the optimum bias to be higher because of the unknowns and the risks associated with projects. And then, as the project develops and and you become more aware of the actual risks, normally the optimum bias uh, becomes lower. So the optimum bias has come down, um, and I know that in some of the um, evidence that you had uh, with um, SIB before, there was a conversation around: um, was there a temptation? What was? Did, did people tend to play down the need for optimism bias because there was a desire <coughs> to deliver a project? There's a desire to say it's affordable, um, and certainly when you go back to the um, the original cost for um, placement. Um, the original request, I think, for the total stadium project was higher than what was actually given. Um, so I do think that um, optimist bias is something that needs to be challenged very considerably in projects. And yeah, I do I've believe been, that... I've been sort of project teams on and off for probably 20, 25 years, to be honest, and it sort of bugs me, the optimum bias, to be honest. Sometimes I go the other way. I sort of feel like it's a free hand for a contractor to put a few more bills in and receive up additional income from the project? It, it, is, it, is, it is very, very challenging to get that right, because obviously yeah. there's so many unknowns in a project, and there has to be that balance between overinflating the cost of the project, but still building in. I suppose, to be, to be honest with you, and I'll let Jacqueline maybe add to this, um, given the fact that Casement was always a more complex project than the other two projects, maybe you know, going back to that now, with hindsight, we would have said there should have been more optimum bias in, in that project. I don't know, Jack, have you anything to add to that? <coughs> yeah, well, there actually was more at the time. Um, the optimism bias in this project uh, was started at the programme level. So in the OBC, um, which is, as you know, um, is, happens before the procurement, the optimism bias should be at a higher level. So at that point, the optimism bias in the OBC was set at 10%. So therefore, when each individual project was invited to submit their business cases, they, within their own business cases, adopted the optimism bias calculator as they would to calculate the um, optimism bias for their project based on data for previous projects and benchmarking, etc. And each of the optimism biases was set separately for each of the three projects. 5%, um, for example, for Kingspan, um, sorry, 3% for Windsor Park, um, and 4% for Ravenhill, and it was 5% for Casement. Um, in the current um, reassessment, of course, the optimism bias should be reassessed again. It's, it's coming in at around just under 5%, um, which in monetary terms is around 3.5 million. Now, there is a question as to whether, as there are now more unknown risks, for example, COVID-19 has a really um, unprecedented impact on construction industry that as yet is, is undefined and I know CPD are in negotiations with the sector to see how that's going to go. There suppose there would be an argument should we be looking at optimism bias across the piece and reflecting it upwards again because it's meant to reflect the risks. So 
as a programme, we have used it very much as an active tool, and yes, it starts high, quite rightly it comes down. Um, but optimism bias is, um, the use of optimism bias is very um, stringently defined in our funding agreement with the grantee, with each of the governing bodies. So they can't use it willy-nilly, they have to apply to the department to use it. They have to go through, we have to go through our economists to approve the use of it within the terms of how optimism bias should be used. So even though it's allocated, there are very strong, um, there has to be very strong reasons to use it, and there is a process to go through to actually get approval to use it. Okay. And, and finally, just at this stage, the, uh, the sub-regional programme had identified X amount of pounds for each of the sports, and it was in around sort of 64 million, I believe, in around that sort of range. That's obviously crept up now, uh, and I know that the TA were putting some of their own finances towards it as well, which would take out of the equation. But now that there's going to be a, a fast overspend at Casement Park, will the other sports see any increase in their allocation? Because it was meant to be an equal spread across the board. So you're correct in that um, at the time there was a balance of the funding. Um, and that was the uh, 36.2 for um, soccer, uh, which was um, to, to when budget became available, was the way I think the executive agreement was, was put forward. Um, um, obviously, these, with the increase in case, with, with casement, um, all these things will, obviously, the minister will have to decide on, on these and also the executive because um, this was an executive priority. So the minister will uh, have to come back to the executive on this. Okay, just it's been, a, in my opinion, a very bad five or six years on this project. And I have to be honest and say, I don't think we've seen the end of the additional funding yet. And we're very lucky if we see 110 or less spent on the site. But thanks very much for your answers. Um, you, you mentioned the decal committee, and Mr. Hillage and I are both survivors of that committee and have the scars. David, um, can I just ask, we, we visited the three studio, Ravenhill was completed, Windsor was in the middle of its completion and the work hadn't started in casement. That's still the case, work hasn't started in casement. To, this, to date, what is the cost of the public purse in casement park? So the costs um, so far are set, uh, haven't changed much from the NIO report. Um, the ten, t about ten point, I think ten point five million up to March twenty twenty. Um, so um, originally, the development costs would have estimated to be about five million. So um, the obviously development costs have gone up um, a bit to more around about eleven million. We would expect somewhere in the region of eleven million pounds of taxpayers' money has been spent on what? So there's um, obviously a project like this requires expertise, um, um, consultants, design teams, um, planning fees, uh, pre-construction designs, survey and admin costs, so a variety of costs. The, um, the fact is that we would have to acknowledge that some of those costs obviously are higher because the casement had to be designed twice. Um, so obviously that would have put up the amount of money around the, the design of, of casement. Um, some of those costs obviously were always going to be required, but there are additional costs there because basement had to go through a whole process of redesign. And, and at least twice then, we've, we, money has been spent on designs that may even still not be final designs that are going to be used? Well, we, we're very hopeful that the existing design, yeah. which is, um, I mean, the, the power did say, say that the, the new design was a superior design. Uh, it is, you know, an iconic design. It, it is does address. It, it has been a, done to address all of the issues that were raised through the PAR, through the CAL committee, um, through the residents' engagement. So we we really hope that the design is used. Mr. Hillich also made mention of the, the the local community and the residents there, and they when we were on the decal committee, there was a very active. Um, uh, residents group who were both appeared in front of us as witnesses but were regular attenders in the public gallery. Um, uh, confidence uh, was an issue then, communication was an issue then, buy-in from the community was, was an issue then. 
I mean, has, have these been addressed? I think that um, everything that could reasonably be done, I believe, has been done. There are obviously, during the power review, they interviewed um, both sets of communities, so Mora and also um, Arc, the, um, the other community group. So, as I said, Casement does have passion on both sides in terms of people really want it. Um, I, obviously, it's, it still waits to be seen what happens in terms of the planning decision. <laughs> Um, I, I think that the, the, the most recent on record from Mora would be that they, they believe that the, the project is still too, too large. And I think and that's, that would be my, my yeah. uh, take on the most recent on public um, announcement on that. Capacity we're looking at at the moment is? 34,500-ish, 30, yes. Sorry, three, mm. five, seven, eight. Because I do remember, as well, happy to be corrected on this, that when we, when we looked at it, um, I know there are more, um, much more knowledgeable people around the GA in this room than me, but the Ulster final is no longer held in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think it's held in Clonus. And in terms of capacity, any time it had been held in Northern Ireland, it never came anywhere near 34,000. So why do we need 34,000 still? The, I, I think, and this is from my record, uh, my memory, um, 2016 was, the, was about 33,000 um, in, um, in Northern Ireland for the, the final. I think that's about, um, about the, 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 for a regional stadium um, to hold the Ulster final back in Northern Ireland, it will have to have that sort of capacity. Okay. Um, it's, there's Clonus and the other place that they're holding them. Is, and I'm forgetting, somebody else can remind me. This is the one I went to, so I okay. <laughs> can't remember what the other one is. Okay, and just finally, before I bring some members in, um, you made mention about people when they came in uh, to, to give evidence to the, to the DECAL committee, perhaps held their own particular view. Um, what, what I very clearly remember, though, is that when Mr. Scott came in, who was the, uh, the, the safety advisor to Sport in Northern Ireland, employee of Sport and I at that time, and we all know what happened there. Mr Scott dealt in facts. Valerie Brown from Belfast City Council dealt in facts. The Blue Light people dealt in facts. They didn't hold a view, they dealt in facts. And I think it's important to put that on the record. Um, okay, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your <coughs> comments so far and I remember uh, yeah you're right about the thirty four and a half I think thirty four and a half thousand is is good enough capacity to take an Ulster fine we've we've taken sixty five thousand to Crow Park for an Ulster fine in the past. So um <coughs> I just want to I want to go back to the the NAO report, the audit office report in relation to the safety concerns itself. And um is the department satisfied that working along with the safety technical group and the GAA that can, you can meet best practice associated with the safety in the stadium? I'm absolutely, um, I'm absolutely um, comfortable with that. I mean, I've spoken to the SRO in detail about this. I've looked over all of the detail that I can find on this. Um, I believe that the, um, the most recent design um, was signed off by the STG. The STG has um, very um, well qualified people in it. Um, the Sports Ground Safety Authority participated <coughs> in that group um, and uh, as I say they, they do um, international safety as well as the statutory responsibility for soccer stadiums in GB um, So, and, and also the fact is that the, the work on this has led to best practice um, so I am comfortable as accounting officer that all of those issues have been taken into account in this redesign. Thank you, and I'm, I'm mindful other members may have made other questions. So <clears throat> I just want to go back to the report because it's a key report for us. See, seeing some of the things that the, the uh, report has um, recommended in terms of on what they've outlined, some of the major problems that has faced capital projects in general. I mean, the, the issue of, of funding legal challenges and also planning issues, um, and this this is it made me a hard question to answer, but I want to just try and get your view on it, if I may, because being a councillor, understand community engagement, 
in most of the planned applications. You, you learn that when you're in council. Um, can you give me an overview in terms of what we've learned from all this and where we can go forward? And I don't want to concentrate particularly in terms of the community engagement as well, if you may. Yeah, so, I mean, the original plan uh, with for for the the um, placement which fell did have community engagement, and it, and it did uh, meet the statutory requirements. Um, having said that, um, there is no doubt that um, the resistance to this was obviously quite significant, and I think that um, we've learned we've we've moved on a lot, I suppose, during that period in terms of how we undertake community engagement. Um, and indeed, um, as I mentioned, the, the amount of time taken, the community engagement was twice the, 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 the normal time. Also, there's lessons to be learned in terms of good practice in this. Um, and what we've done is, you know, we've spoken to some other projects, um, the Belfast, uh, Belfast um, Transport Hub, we've spoken to them about what they're doing. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, it's the old thing sometimes, uh, you know, takes time at the front end of a project to, to do the community engagement as best you can. That doesn't mean and, and, and that you're, you're ever going to get everybody to the same space um, because there will be people who you know, are just you know, don't, don't want something to happen. But it does mean that insofar as you can, that you've taken account of those views and you can demonstrate that you've done that. And that is really, really important in the planning application because uh, they have to balance those issues of the um, the objections with the actual, as I say, the, the, the impact of, um, of the project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Flynn. Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks very much for, for coming along today. Um, <coughs> and I suppose I should just say I'm OS Belfast MLA, so um, I have many friends and family that live within that, that small um, area surrounding casement. Um, so I'm well aware of you know, the sort of ups and downs and the journey that, that we've went through over the past um, number of years um, with getting the, the planning process to where it is now. Um, and I know that at times it was, um, and it had been particularly tense at times with, with the residents who had genuine concerns, and some of them still do. Um, but I suppose a lot of these points have already been touched on. David touched on some of them, um, as did uh, Cahill. And just as you finished off there around this issue of community engagement and maybe thinking like practically moving forward so you know no department is in this position where we do have this backlog and, and delay and, and judicial review is there any practical steps that the department could take um you know to try and promote a better engagement process you know where you can learn from i know it's difficult it's very difficult at times to tell as well or to foresee because as you had said, Tracy, depending on the community itself or that resident's belief of what they want or what they, they don't want. Um, but just if there has been any specific learning in relation to the, the casement process um, and how you could sort of, you know, like monitor in future future projects, you know, that you're being clear from the outset or whatever it is that we can do to make that process like streamlined and, and strengthened. So. The, in the major projects, um, there are, uh, so this, some of the common themes around that are, um, you know, the length of time that it's going to take to to come to fruition, um, the uh, the actual cost, obviously, um, higher costs, and more likely to get procurement issues, and projects with bigger impacts on local communities, obviously, are also more likely to um, uh, to have objections to them. And I suppose some of the lessons are at the front end of projects is to really assess them against the issues that are, are have the main projects fail, not just in Northern Ireland. And I know the evidence you had previously, that, you know, was very clear that eight out of ten major projects, you know, worldwide uh, run into issues. So the issue of um, at the front end really taking the time and, you know, aside from, I, I suppose, just capital projects, but more broadly in terms of government delivering services to citizens. Uh, I would say to you that actually COVID-19 has taught us a lot, um, where we had to actually move very, very quickly. Um, and that and actually the need to actually get really quickly engaging with the community and voluntary sector and to actually get things out on the ground. So having, you know, treating those relationships, you know, with, with respect and trust, um, 
right across the piece. Um, so obviously there is a time where you have to actually then say, right, we've done our engagement and you've, you, you, you've, you've actually learned all the lessons you can, you've built it in and you have to move on. And you can never be certain that you've addressed everybody's issues to their satisfaction. But, you know, we need to have demonstrated we've done the best that we can in that. And I think that um, in this project, there is quite a lot of significant evidence that that, that has actually happened. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would agree with that because, as I said, coming from the local area um, and, and speaking to people on the doors, including the people that, that I'd not connected to through friends or family who live in the, the immediate area, but you can, you can, as an elected rep for the area, I can certainly sense um, a, a change and a want. Um, and, you know, there is an expectation overall in West Belfast that people do want to see the, the project delivered. Um, so I hope I hope that can that can be the case. My my final question, if you don't mind, Chair. Um, so in the the um, NIAO report, which obviously predated the return of the devolved um, administration, uh, it directly referenced an inability to progress the draft business case and funding gaps um, unless and until a minister um, was returned. So I'm just wondering, is the department now satisfied that these elements can be progressed um, immediately after any planning decision? So, yes, I, I am on record as saying, as a, an official, that um, I, I wouldn't have had the authority to reset an executive commitment around a budget. Um, so once the planning is completed, um, then we, we will have to actually relook at the full business case and the costs. Uh, and you'll appreciate the fact that it's impossible to actually identify the cost of the projects until we have a time frame for delivery of the project because time equals money as we've seen in this project. Um, so once, the, um, once the, the full business case is developed with the costs and approvals are in place um, and the, the contract is sorted, then, we can, then it'll, this will have to come back to the executive to actually finalise the actual overall costs, and that will be a matter for ministers. Okay, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tracia. Jacqueline. The original plan and permission for Casement Park was quashed in December 2014. That's five and a half years ago. It seems as though the various safety and traffic concerns that have been raised at that time were dismissed at high levels in your would you agree with this, and do you consider there are any lessons to be learned from this in the future? Um, yeah, the um, the the I've, I've studied the the JR at the time, and it's very clear in the JR that um, the judgment was that there were errors in how aspects were processed, rendering the decision unlawful. Um, I would say that the JR makes it very clear. It says nothing about the merits of the stadium, but more about the process. Um, where the actual error was, was around, the, the, the big issue was around the assessment of the effects of a capacity crowd <coughs> um, and how that had been calculated. Uh, the difference um, between what was deemed to be the attendance of the previous casement and the new casement, so that was uh, 5,400. Um, the view of the judge that there was neither a fair nor lawful approach. Um, now, um, there were other issues in there too around the fact that the PSNI had made comments um, which were not passed on to the then minister and a couple of other things around um, other uses of the project and also asbestos and Japanese knotweed. So clearly there were, there were errors. What I would say is that the... The way the traffic assessment had been done was the same as had been done for, for the other two stadium. But I come back to the point as this, this was a much bigger project um, and a much more complex area. So um, obviously how that had been calculated was not satisfactory in terms of uh, when, when it was looked at by the planning service um, that, they, that, that they didn't use their own guidance in, in how that was assessed. So, there are lessons in there in terms of understanding that casement was different than the than the other the other two projects, um, and a completely different approach um, has been taken to the assessment of traffic in the um, the new application, um, and uh, for example, much more emphasis on a sustainable traffic plan 
Um, I don't know whether Jacqueline, you've anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would also say in, in reverting to the zero baseline as well in the new planning application, um, whilst it may and has probably increased the workload in the assessment phase, it's important to recognise that the learning and the lessons from the JR in the baseline assessment in the first one. Um, secondly, what I would say a very important lesson is Tracy hits on it that it's complex projects um, and it's about expanding the capability of, of, our, of our networks in Northern Ireland. Um, the second time round, uh, the Caseman Park project team um, explored uh, the use of consultants from the UK um, in traffic assessment and other parts, um, other uh, parts of Scotland, England, who were very um, experienced in particularly traffic assessments in major Premier League a football stadium, for example, <clears throat> and other stadia across uh, the Europe and the world. So they um, particularly sought out the expertise the second time around, um, having unpicked the assessment in the first JOR to say, well, OK, what do we need to do the second time around? We need to do the zero baseline and we need to um, examine um, examine how we how the consultants do it and and that capability when you buy in capability it's not lost you do build the capability of local people in northern ireland and i'd cer certainly say um, that has been built through the process as well and the sgsa have acknowledged that in, in terms of um, what they've witnessed on the stg so there have been a lot of lessons uh, learned and implemented i would say the second time around thank you very much I'm more than answer thank you Chair. so it is important at this stage to remember and you're building that capacity and that capability, which is hugely important, and we as a committee were discussing that some weeks ago around the civil service. It is important to remember we've lost the capacity that was there with Mr Scott and Ms Strong in terms of capacity that was being able, able to be bought in across the UK because of the expertise that was there. And as Mr Hilly Dreadley identified earlier, has been lost in Northern Ireland at a governmental level. Um, thank you, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and I would echo your comments at the very beginning around the work of the Department during the pandemic has been greatly appreciated. Um, just in relation to the issue about capability and skills that has been touched upon by a number of members, um, the Strategic Investment Board has been set up there to give advice. and just want to know what role did it play in relation to the casement project and what advice did it give? So, uh, Jacqueline is actually an SIB employee who is embedded in the department um, and has been a great asset to the team. Um, she has been with us on the team four and a half years. Also, the project uh, manager uh, for the um, GAA is also an SIB employee that the department pays for to bring extra expertise. Um, and we would. Um, we would actually use SIB as, as we require them to, to um, Jacqueline obviously can, um, can build into her own network within SIB. So um, the department has um, used SIB over a number of years. I mean, actually right back to the, the start of the project, SIB have, have been involved in the project. Just reflecting upon that then, obviously the judicial review was taken and the projects were significantly delayed. So um, is, is the SIB really providing that a level of advice and support that, that is needed to ensure that those delays don't occur? And around that judicial review, obviously it was taken around the plan application. Um, and you know, what concerns is there around silo departmental work and where really th those issues that occurred led to that judicial review? were as a result of information that wasn't fed through and what ways we can learn lessons to ensure that that doesn't occur? Yes, the, um, we're, the, the, the lessons that we need to learn about that is that um, I think this, this, the, at the, prog at the prog programme board level, um, I think the same approach was taken to three projects. I, I, I mean, that, that where one was much more complex um, and that we did need to reset the governance and the processes. The 2015 power was very clear on that point. Um, so there are lessons we have learned. So, you know, yes, you need. Also, the other thing, sorry, the power uh, recommended was that there was a full time SRO. Um, and again, you've had evidence here that um, the importance of the SRO having the appropriate qualifications. Um, and at that stage, then post the 2015 uh, power. The SRO um, was um, qualified in the major projects leadership, um, um, so brought a different uh, 
you know, set of skill sets to that as well. And indeed, the, the current SRO um, has also got a qualification in uh, projects. So uh, I think that there are the lessons are quite clear um, in the 2015 power of the need to um, look at some of the expertise and reset some of the governance processes. And all 20 of the recommendations made in that were implemented. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Beggs. Again, I, I too would like to put on record my thanks to your department for the work during this COVID period, and in particular in many communities, you've actually helped empower communities to help look after those in need within their own communities. That's been a very positive outcome in many areas. Um, looking at the three regional st stadium projects, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what has happened uh, in that, uh, in terms of Keynespan, it's estimated at, let me see, uh, six and a half million. The, the, the final cost is estimated to be six and a half million. On budget, uh, then you go to Windsor Park. Uh, again, it was 35 million, and it's cost 35 million, no cost overruns. We know there was a, the issue during the build process, but the contractor's insurance would have had to have paid for that. But then when you come to the Casement Park, the numbers are all up the left. They're really quite strange. Estimates 77.5 million. It's now moved to 110, and as has been said, possibly still moving. A 32.5 million additional money from the public purse. 40. That's almost 42 percent overrun in, in cost. So can you explain to me what's went wrong with that one project when the others two went in exactly on cost? Um, I think that. Uh in the casement project, the range of issues. Um, first of all, uh, there was underestimation of the resistance. Uh, it was a more complex project. Um, it was a project um, which um, had some, um, there were some relationship issues in the middle of this, this as well. Um, uh, it was a project that um, was much bigger in scale. So, um, that, that's that's really a very you know the other projects just in terms of scale um, Kingspan you know it was adding some stadium onto what was already there um, and Windsor Park was also so the level of ambition in casement was much bigger um, and that you know sort of starting from scratch brand new stadium on the site that scale in a very enclosed site yeah. was a very different level of ambition and complexity. So I think that does explain some of the, the reasons why the other, the other project. Now, there were issues with the other projects, but they still came in in time. I know on, um, there was a few issues around uh, Windsor and the collapsing, the, but that was outside of the project. Um, so um, you should declare, and it just, uh, Mr. Hilly and I were both in the stand that night, but I don't think it was we were responsible for <laughs> <laughs> over, over 10 million it's cost to date without Spade being in the ground. Can you give us a breakdown of those costs? Because that's quite a large sum of public money that's been spent. Yeah, so um, the large majority of that, the 6.4 million of that, was on consultants, design and legal fees. Um, planning fees, um, 171,000. Um, the integrated supply team pre-construction design input, uh, 2 million. Mm -hmm. um, salaries, uh, about one, just under 1.6 million. Survey and admin costs uh, around about three hundred thousand. Um, Jacqueline has a much more detailed breakdown of that. If 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 you if you require any further detail, that the, the costs initially is estimated should for development costs were five million. So the, the development costs have doubled. Um, that in in the in the. Now, you, you said yourself that the casement application. All, all three sites are in. in confined urban areas, but you've said that the casement development was much more ambitious. They were trying to squeeze much, much more into that tight space. Can you advise how the risk of doing that was shared? Does all the risk fall on the public purse? Um, so the total cost of casement, uh, the, the original split was obviously 80-20. Um, uh, so the, the um, cost of GAA um, were um, intending that there was a commitment from them to, to, to fund part of the costs as well. Um, so 
that you know there there is there is a shared risk to that extent that there was a con there is a intended contribution. But what I'm trying to get is who pays all of the extra money? That they're the person that carries the risk, and what incentive is there to cut your cloth according to your site? Yeah. So so as I said, I think I said already the the final cost. And, and how they're, uh, they're, how they're, they're um, agreed between the executive and the GAA will will be something that that will have to be worked out once we get the final final costs. At this minute in time, what's the additional cost to the public curse? Is the public carrying all the additional costs to date? So I don't, Jacqueline, can you answer well, that question in terms of how much GAA put into the ten? The, sorry, the the. the the, the cost to date, the, the costs that are in the 110 are estimated costs at the moment. Um, the GA have spent about 10% of the estimated cost to date out of the 10 million. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm trying going. to understand. Uh, the original estimate was 77 million. The new estimate is 100 million. Is that new additional cost shared with their, all the parties? That funding split uh, has to be, uh, has has to to be, be agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you did ask about. And what, what is the split? The original split was 80-20, but that has not been negotiated yet. So you haven't done a deal? No, there hasn't been a deal done. The, the, deal, the, deal, the, the final costs of the project won't be known until we have planning, um, and until such times we know the total costs. Okay. Um, there hasn't been a negotiation on the costs. I mean, my, my concern here, the additional £32 million, pound, that would build five brand new sizable primary schools. This is a big amount of money. and. Nobody knows where this is going, so there's still considerable risk at cost to the public purse. Do you not accept that? It's not a, is that not a, a poor way to manage any project? Um, I would accept that uh, there are, you know, the, the delay in the project is no, nobody's happy with the delay in the project. Um, the time delay of six years. But I'm not talking about the delay. I'm talking about the way it's set up because nobody knows who's paying at this stage. Is that correct? Well, we we know what the commitment from the executive has been to date. And we know what the commitment has been from the, the Ulster GAA to date. But what hasn't been done is a renegotiation of those, of those costs. And the decision has been that those costs will not be renegotiated until such time as we know what the final costs are. Just think there's more risks involved. Thank you. OK, thank you. Mr McHugh. Uh, Fajr Rolf. Uh, you're very welcome here today. It's fantastic to be able to uh, and Jeshna at large for you. It's very nice to be able to just chat about this opportunity, you know, a casement and the work on that that has gone on to date, which we're all disappointed about uh, the um, obstacles, maybe many of them have been put in the way of uh, the development of this particular project. But uh, I know um, that I, I do hope it will come to fruition uh, in the very, very near future. Uh, I am one of those people who has attended Ulster finals when there has been 65,000 at them in Crow Park and the likes of it. And I've also attended them in Clonus, when there's been capacity crowds there as well too. And I know the difficulties of getting out of Clonus uh, uh, after an Ulster final. I've never had the same difficulty, mind you, any of the times that I attended in the old casement, and there were some very, very large crowds there as, as well. Uh, but I'm glad to see that that sort of traffic plan or the rest of it and that has been discussed and put in place. And that, um, uh, again, too, uh, in terms of um, uh, the costs and that, and that um, um, the very fact that the GA have stepped up to the plate to date. Uh, and I'm sure, too, that uh, they'll not be found wanting uh, in the event of that plan permission um, uh, coming forward and the, the project being able to be progressed. Um, just on the one on, on capacity as well, too, even this year now, uh, in the very first round of the Ulster Championship, Tyrone played Donegal, uh, my county is Tyrone, and I do hope that we get through the first round and go on to one Ulster. But the Tyrone-Donegal match, they're actually mooting that it should be played in Crow Park this year. And this is because of COVID. And none of us know just how long COVID is going to be with us in any respect. So it is important that we do have a national stadium here in Belfast that uh, can provide at that level. Provide at that level in the event of dealing with the likes of COVID and that as well too, so that we can have a capacity crowd that could attend. 
uh, and I'm sure that'll be a fact that'll have to be taken on board. Uh, and I know that in the event of them developing casement, that uh, they'll have no difficulty in filling it when it does come to us to finals. Um, one of the elements that has always sort of come in the way of um, many of these projects has been judicial reviews. And uh, maybe do you have any sort of opinion there on the likelihood I, of uh, there being judicial reviews and any other element of this particular planning process at the present time, as far as casements is concerned? Um, obviously, we've looked at the potential timeframes for the project moving forward, and we factored into that with or without a judicial review. It would be, I think, uh, may of us not to expect that that is a, that is a possibility. We're hoping that it's, it doesn't come to pass, but there is no doubt that it is a possibility. And just on that, I would think too that maybe the work that has been done now in terms of consultation, a community consultation, might, if anything, minimise the likelihood of a judicial review. I, I think that um, there's, I suppose the first aspect is that hopefully the consultation will, but also um, if there is a judicial review, um, that that actually that the work that's being done to address the issues that there will not be found errors um, the way there was the previous time around how uh, traffic management was managed. So mm -hmm. that th those are those are kind of the factors that we are having to look at at a programme board around some of the risks around the project. And just finally, in terms of time frame, uh, as far as planning and that is concerned at present, are you prepared to put any uh, date on that? Obviously, planning is outside of my department's control. Um, having said that, um, we are aware now that um, we have um, the, the further uh, environmental information requests are completed. Um, um, there was a very robust um, challenge um, uh, throughout the process, and it won't be a surprise to people that, given the fact that the, the project was JR previously, that a lot of time and, and careful thought was given into, and, and legal reviews was given into any of the information. Um, but um, our, we understand that that the, de the department are in, um, the, we understand that DFI are ready to make a recommendation, and uh, we also understand that they have indicated that COVID nineteen has impacted that. Jacqueline, anything? It did, um, it's impacted it. Um, I think they were ready to make one at Easter, and now we're we're being told hopefully by the end of the summer. But there's been communication and engagement with, between the GAA and DFI in recent months and found that the implications there have been because of the COVID situation. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. So we're ready to make a recommendation on what? Well, a recommendation on the, whatever their recommendation is, and <laughs> you'll appreciate that was, a, that was a Sir Humphrey answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll appreciate that there are obviously Chinese walls between uh, DFI and my department um, because they have to take an independent decision. Um, and whilst you know everybody appreciates it, it's taken quite some time um, to get to get to here. We also do understand, and I know the GA are very disappointed how long it's taken. They've put that on record. Um, it, but it's, it's understandable that given the previous um, um, experience that, uh, that people want to make sure they have properly balanced all of the information that they have received in terms of environmental factors. Okay. Um, Mr O'Toole. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for, for, for um, both your department's work in the last few months and, and your evidence today. Um, just further to what we've been discussing, um, in terms of the next stages, um, that the infrastructure department and the minister have basically be a, a kind of quasi-judicial decision to make. Is that right? All right the Planning. Yeah. Am, I, am I sorry if I'm not? The mic isn't picking me up correctly. Is it fair to describe the decision that has to be made as quasi-judicial in terms of the the next stage of the planning process? So the planning DFI will make a will make a recommendation to the minister whether or yes. not the planners actually support or don't support, and then there'll be a decision of whether the planning commission is granted. Um, following that, then. The last time round, what happened was there's a period following the planning where people have the opportunity to make objections, and the same thing will happen this time. Um, and then, follow, assuming that no objections have made, then we move ahead to the the next stage of the project. The but, but the point I'm making is that the, the 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 minister's rule, the infrastructure minister's rule, is effectively kind of quasi-judicial in that sense. Is that right, or is it or is that unfair to? Well, they 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 will be the final decision maker. 
the minister is the final decision maker in in the in terms of planning. And once that comes back to that, then goes back. Once that decision is made and the planning process is sorted out, then it returns to the your department in terms of managing build. That's correct. So. So we, we don't manage the build, the GAA do that. So it's, so the project, sorry, rather than the yeah, build itself. I'm, yeah. it, so the, our, the, our department is responsible for the program, the steady program, for the delivery of all the projects. The actual the delivery of the pro program is through the three splitting codes. So yeah. it's up to the GAA then to actually deliver the project. It's, so basically they, they report up into our program board and we hold them accountable in terms of you know, our responsibility at a, at a programme level. And are you confident that at a departmental level you have um, staffing expertise and everything ready to go, as it were, for when um, the, the thing progresses beyond planning? Absolutely. I mean, as, as you'll have seen, there was a further commitment to this project, NDNA, um, and I know that um, the executive is still remains committed to deliver this project, and it's our, it's our job as officials to uh, make sure that, that we are ready to to deliver, uh, in far as whatever is in our control. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Fearon, can, can I just ask, could you furnish this committee with a breakdown of the £11 sure, million, pounds, yes. if, you don't, if you don't mind, to date? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> can I just return to the issue of the... Um, Jacqueline, you said about uh, the uh, lessons being learned in terms of the previous judicial review. Um, I think it's fair to say, in my experience, having sat on the committee before, none of the residence groups are opposed to a stadium. It is the size of the stadium is the issue. Um, community engagement has been talked about quite a lot. The w unless it's changed, uh, and uh, I'm not in that area now in terms of portfolio, there were two residence groups, still remaining two residence groups. Yeah. W where are we with those two respective residence groups? I mean, are they content um, in terms of going forward? So, I think that the um, the most recent on record view of Mora would be that um, they are not opposed to a stadium, but they believe that the stadium should be twenty five thousand. I think I think that's the most recent. Statement on record. While the other the other residents group would be very much in favour of this project proceeding as quickly as possible, at the maximum at capacity, thirty four thousand. Thirty four thousand. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the the assessment of the capacity and crowds that that's been ongoing, some of the issues were around emergency exiting because of the site and it's it's, it's sort of locked because they. Motorway is behind it. Kennedy Way is to the side of it. And certainly, when I visited, there was one laneway through down into Kennedy Way. There wasn't the infrastructure there in terms of roads, in terms of pathways, in terms of parking, uh, that that could have facilitated um, the sort of stadium that that people want in terms of the optimum. Has progress been made on that? Yeah, there's there has been quite a significant progress around sort of increasing the number of exits, but also in the infrastructure around the edge and how the actual um, site is being used. Jacqueline, do you want to take take through the, the new exit, the, the stop yeah. lane, and the, how, we, how that's all been? Well, basically, um, the challenge for the the designers on the resetting of the project in 2015 was to incorporate all of the concerns from the um, CAL committee from the residents and, and the issues that were addressed in the power and somehow come up with a design that um, rectified all of those issues. Um, I was starting with the department just around that time, so I was in the fringes of that work being done. And the design that has come up with has incorporated all of those changes. Um, the, the site that you were talking about, the original design, designed right up to what you would call the red line of the site. <coughs> the exiting from the building exited effectively straight out of the site onto the road effectively. You'll remember that six out of the eight exits at that time were all out onto Anderson's Town Road and that was one of the concerns. There's now nine exits all around the, um, the building, the proposed building. 
and um, they are proposed to be used all of the time, not just uh, for maximum capacity. The idea being that the crowds, and very often it's um, re repeat people that go to return to matches, the, the crowds will get used to how the stadium works, will get used to going and en entrancing and exiting. Other improvements that have been made to address that is that uh, there's an a circulation area called a Zone 4, and that's a circulation area that people will go to uh, as they exit a stadium. Um, and also, if there was an addition <coughs> of a stadium, that's one of the areas they would go to. In the original design, again, because it was out to the red line, that was outside of the of the building. Now the Zone 4 is, is in the building as well. Um, there's also increased... Um, there's now basement car parking underneath it as well, um, and um, the uh, the height has been reduced, and um, the it's height of the stand, the height of the stadium, yes, has been reduced by 12 metres all around. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So what they've done is they've actually the stadiums different si uh, heights on different sides. So where it's at adjuncting to the, to the houses, it's lower, yeah. and it's higher at the other end where it's not. So it's been a really, I mean, it's quite, it's a very clever design. Um, and but I think it's also important to point out that um, there is a, there is also a desire to change the the how people actually travel to to the stadium to incorporate sustainable transport and of course <coughs> there is now the glider that goes uh, up and down there as well so uh, you know there is a sort of and the GAA recognised they need to do some work to change uh, how their members actually approach co coming to the stadium and and in incorporate sort mm. of different park and rides and various other things. <coughs> come into it. It's okay. So just finally then, there are nine exits yes. in this new proposed stadium. How do they, how, designing accidents, exits is one thing. How are they getting out of it? Are, are you, is the proposal to buy property and knock them down? Yes, there, with the, 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 there's no plans to buy property and, and knock them down for exiting. They're, the exiting that they're proposing, um, there is, you're right, Tracy, they're, they're going to use some areas at the bottom of Stockman's Lane using the pedestrian flow through the um, current pedestrian access there. But um, not a huge, it's not a huge, it, amount, a huge amount of land when you come down that path at Kennedy Way at the roundabout to, to facilitate people moving. There has been a huge amount of modelling done around this, um, incorporating um, some very complicated software whereby um, you, you look at a stadium and you, you factor in the crowds at various capacity games and then factoring in the exits, how people entrance and how people exit, how the crowd flows, depending on the age, depending on their ability. Um, so there's an awful lot of modelling being done around this and okay. we have been assured that it has improved significantly. Mr. Boyle. Thank you for letting me back in, Chairs. Just back to the audit report, uh, it specifically mentions the power review. Yes. Uh, and I'm just wondering how important that is in setting the direction for the department, the project itself, and also the GEA. Well, the power, the power review. I mean, there was, there was. I think there was three things that fundamentally reset this project. First of all, the the um, the JR. Secondly, the CAL committee, um, and the focus on safety. And the third was the the, the power review, which um, was was a very robust piece of work, looking at not just the project to date, but how it needed to change going forward and how it needed to build expertise. Uh, and I would say that actually that has been fundamental in resetting the project. Um, and um, all the recommendations of that um, have been implemented. The power review at the time, uh, it was actually amber red uh, because there was still a lot of work to do. A year afterwards, the power review was amber. So the follow-up to the power review um, demonstrated that a lot had been done. So I, I think it's probably it's, it's interesting that um, I think again SIB in their evidence said some of the stuff that had been identified previously around projects in terms of lax project management that the power reviews has been absolutely so important in this project in terms of actually turning turning it around. Okay, Mr. Hillage. Thanks, thanks, Chairman. Thank you for letting me come back on this situation. Uh, going back to Mr. Beggs's point in relation to the potential overspend, I think the GAA are on record of maybe around February this year of stating that they weren't going to be responsible for any further outlay on the stadium. Would that be correct? I know you're. Are you going to try and negotiate that position, or is that factual that they're saying no? I think it's on the record. I think I saw that too. That they said they weren't going to. Um, 
obviously this will be a matter for a conversation with the GEA once we get the final costs. Um, but also, ultimately, it'll be down to what the minister and the executive and, and how far they're prepared to go. And the really important point here is the executive, if, if this is a executive you know, priority, uh, balancing the requirements of this project against other projects, the executive has said that, that they want this project to be delivered. Um, so there is, there is some negotiation uh, to, to be done, I, I, I believe, um, in, you know, around making sure that it's, you know, it's, it's our job as officials to ensure that every project um, is delivered at the best value that we can. So, <coughs> so, sorry, I probably should have declared an interest. As a, I'm a student of the uh, CF Sports Grounds Authority, so they certified me a few times. Some people said I should have been certified years ago. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just get in there before I was going to say that. Uh, 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 so I just wanted then to follow up with... Uh, Obviously, if things had went properly in around 10 years ago, listening to Mr Scott, we would be in a much different place at this stage. We would potentially have the thing built and operational, but it would be, it would be fair to say that, really. Because don't forget, you bring consultants, and consultants tell the person who's paying them what they really want to hear at the end of the day. And that's how it got into such a mess the last time. And what was really a nonsense of a safety plan to, to get the people out. And it was really dangerous, to be honest. So... The project at the time of the CAL committee had already been through the JR, so the project was already at that stage in a situation where the traffic management needed to be uh, reassessed. Mm. Um, um, and obviously safety concerns raised by Mr Scott were subsequently picked up. So um, I'm not certain that we lost time. Um, well. Obviously, you lost. You know, obviously, you had the CAL committee and all the things, but they really did shine a light on safety. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that. We should never have got to that point, really, as it came to the committee. Really, should it? It should have been dealt with long before that. Yeah, well, and, and again, the, and I hate. I mean, even going back to the power review is really, really clear on the point about um, the weaknesses in terms of the escalation routes mm -hmm. between the um, the and also. The fact that there wasn't issues logs, <coughs> that there wasn't a formal sign-off process, so all of those things needed to be built in in the project going forward. And then you spoke of the, the infrastructure and how it's going to be uh, subject to scrutiny outside as well, and potentially a new road layout and various things. Is that all within the money that's been set aside as well in the 110, or is that additional since infrastructure how do they can back yet to say? What exactly they require, or giving it the thumbs up, or whatever. So the, 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 the amount of money that's yeah. that's that'll be included in that. Yeah, yeah that's that's that, well, that. The money for the infrastructure will come from the department. Sorry, there, there, there's there's no changes to the infrastructure outside of the site. It's just the it's the management of it. Uh, for example, the part of the management plan will be using the Belfast Rapid Transport System that's in place. Um, so the. There's no changes to the actual road infrastructure outside of the building proposed in the current planning application. It's, um, it's how we use. Yeah, there isn't, yeah. We've talked about yeah. the stockman's Don't forget, at one, stage, mm -hmm. at one stage, the solution was to buy some houses and mm. to remove them to get the stadium sorted right. out from an infrastructure point of view. That's That's and and that, that was, a, I believe, for my time, but I believe that was with the old design that took the design right out to the very edge of the site. Uh -huh. This new design has fundamentally altered the exiting strategy from the stadium by making it a very more compact, albeit complex, but a more compact design. Uh, and can I ask, has a, has a Japanese knotweed been removed? Japanese knotweed has been addressed over the series of this last six years. Yeah. I know that the GAA um, have had um, several remedial courses and check it all the time. Yes, some element, so just elements... just when it's removed, it has to lie for... I was going to say yes, and, and some elements of it on. can grow back in their yeah. pockets of growth. I haven't, seen the, yeah, I haven't seen the Do latest I, report, but I know that they have been addressing it over the series, uh, uh, course of the last year. And of course, if, if they make the point, if they, really, if they wanted to go to a greenfield site, build a 44, 45 seer stadium, the thing again probably would have been well down the road by now, and probably at half the cost, to be fair. I think that's a fair comment to make at this stage. Okay, I would just. I'm oh, sorry, sorry if I interrupt. 
What's wrong? I thought you were finished. Sorry. No, and, and, and just to finish myself off, uh, Mr McHugh said there was obstacles put in the road of the development. Well, I have to say that all were legitimate concerns, Mr McHugh, at that stage, uh, stemming from the poor performance of the department and the SIB. All legitimate concerns. There was no obstacles mm. put in the road. Yeah. For the sake of it. Very, very brief one, Chair. Thank you for letting me in. It's actually not on casement because this isn't ju just about casement part. This, it's really going back to, to last the June monitoring round last week to, um, showed the level of under, ca capital underspend in your department. Um, do you think there is any link between some of the findings of the NIAO report and um, your department's ability to get capital spending out the door? Um, I'm sure that is. I'm sure that is to do with what we're talking about. So I'll let it be asked. Yeah. So, so can I be uh, really clear on this? Um, since I came to the department, um, I've introduced a capital oversight program. Um, obviously, my department is not a department that delivers large um, projects very often. But we have very we have large capital projects budgets because we deliver housing, yep. which counts for about seventy five percent of our our capital projects every year, as well as a number of projects in terms of urban regeneration, heritage, sport, arts, culture, so very wide-ranging capital. This year in particular, that underspend was very much down to housing, and the COVID-19 impacted that, and I'd be happy to send the, uh, I'd be happy to give you the detail of that, but effectively that came down to uh, some of the housing associations not having the confidence at the end of the year to actually sign off on some of the um, <coughs> some, of, some of the housing. So I'd be happy to give you a, a brief on that if, if you're ha happy with that. We 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 well, sorry, I personally take a, a personal strong interest in watching capital across the department and how it's spent and showing that it's uh, in line with the minister's priorities and it's maximised. If we can't spend the money, it's really important we give the money up early in the year so it can be used in other parts of, of government. Mr. Briggs, I'll let, I'll let you ask a question if it's relevant. Yeah, it's just housing. Uh, uh, especially bearing in mind your treatment of me yesterday. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> just very briefly in terms of, of, of housing and, and delays capital projects. We're in, inquiring about what are the, co the cause of delays to capital projects generally. And certainly planning is one of the issues that's com coming forward. Uh, at this moment in time, many social housing schemes are being delayed because of lack of the sewage infrastructure. So my question is, how, how are we having a joined up government to ensure that we have capital in the right places for sewage infrastructure in order that you can build your houses that are needed? And that is a conversation that I continue, you know, my, myself and the trainer will continue to have, um, as will the ministers. Um, everybody, both ministers are very keen to make sure that we address housing, housing needs. Um, obviously, the investment in sewage is a, is a big issue across the, across the executive. It's big, very large sums of money, so um, it's something we're very aware of. Would you accept the degree of a dysfunctional government that we have? That well, we can't no, do that? Roy, I, I really don't think that is relevant to what we're talking about. So you've, you've made your point, as you would say. Um, can I thank you both very much for um, coming and for the time taken today? Um, it might be a good idea. I don't know whether you can furnish us with some of the, the drawings that you're talking about. Yes, love to, yeah. I, I must say I remain very concerned whenever I hear that the infrastructure around the stadium isn't going to change. That that doesn't cause me grave concern, I have to say, um, simply because I, I'm not sure the space is there. But I look, I look forward to looking at the, the, the uh, drawings when we receive them. So, um, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And um, we don't see you. Have a good summer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, are there any issues that members would like clarification on from um, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, TOA, or uh, Mr. Um, Donnelly at this stage? Are members content to progress? Happy enough? Okay. We'll, members, will just take a ease for a moment to allow um, the staff to make some changes there. Mm -hmm. yes. This is the Northern. Okay, members, um, we're now back in public session, and I would welcome um, Ms. Katrina Godfrey, uh, Permanent Secretary, Accounting Officer, Department of Infrastructure, Mr. John Irvine, Director of Major Projects and Procurement, Roads Division. Department of Infrastructure, good afternoon. Very welcome. 
Mr. Coffey, do you wish to make an opening statement um, before we commence the meeting? I have a few words. Sir, okay. It doesn't inconvenience. That's fine. Make some conscious of time. Um, thank you for for the opportunity to provide evidence in the report, and, and thank you also to the committee and the staff for accommodating a slot somewhat later than you had originally planned. So um, we're very grateful for that. I suppose, just by way of context, it's worth me saying that as the holder of the by far the largest capital budget in any government department here, we know how important major capital projects are to society and the economy. Now more than ever, as, as we move into recovery, um, but we also know perhaps more than most just how complex they are and how challenging they can be to deliver. And I think the report provides a really useful opportunity to focus on those challenges, but actually to use it as a, a a learning opportunity as well in terms of renewing the debate on how we can overcome them. Um, we're very conscious that the report focuses on a number of projects that my department carries responsibility for and presents a mixed picture, contains some really good examples of successful delivery, um, but it does shine a light on some of the challenges and complexities associated with some of the major projects that we're working to advance. And, it's absolutely right that we're scrutinised on, on those. Um, I did want to make the point that many of those challenges aren't unique to us as DFI or indeed in Northern Ireland. They're challenges that governments across these islands are, are grappling with uh, and indeed governments beyond these islands are grappling with and learning from. Um, and they include, as the report recognises, legal challenges and funding uncertainties. And a particular challenge for me as an accounting officer does relate to how we're funded. So when we're looking at major transport and water-related infrastructure, we're looking at plans lasting decades into the future. Uh, and yet, at the moment, we continue to do so within yeah. one-year budget time horizons. And that presents real challenges. Um, John and I were chatting earlier, and we were reminding ourselves that Highways England, for example, has a, a five-year investment strategy, which is actually legislated for in statute. And officials there reckon, I think it's John, they reckon that before they even get going, that's probably a 20% benefit in value for money terms because they can plan over a, a longer period of time. But I guess our job is to find ways of overcoming those challenges um, and finding ways of, of doing things better. So we very much welcome the report. I would also like to say that we welcome the approach, um, particularly the focus group approach, which allowed us to contribute very openly to sharing some of the, the challenges and lessons that are, that are part of the report. Um, and I also welcome the, the recognition in terms of the um, approach we take in my department to the oversight and delivery of major projects, particularly on the, on the construction side. Final point, Chair, just I know you understand, but in relation to the A5, which is one of the case studies, we are currently awaiting the independent inspector's report following the public inquiry, and <coughs> we will certainly do our best to answer the committee's questions. But it's really important that I don't preempt or prejudice the inspector's finding because they will be so crucial in helping us determine the next stages. And I'm also conscious, and you've just had a very detailed conversation on the um, Casement Park Stadium. You will know that that project is a subject of a live planning application that's at a very, very crucial stage just now. It's approaching a key decision, and it's really important that I don't do or say anything that would in any way prejudice or impact on that process. So just to preserve the integrity of the planning process, um, I'm very happy to talk generally about planning, um, but obviously not on the specifics of any individual application. But other than that, John and I are very happy to give you as much information as we possibly can. Okay, thank you very much. Just before we um, move to questions, can I suggest that in the interest of complying with COVID regulations that you might just kiss it to um, Yep. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, thank you very much. And uh, look, we appreciate uh, your flexibility and understanding. We took a decision as a committee, uh, both with yourselves and with your uh, counterparts in the Department for Communities that we wouldn't ask you to come and give evidence uh, earlier because we just felt that you were dealing with issues that were of life and death and much more important, however important this is, much more important than dealing with, with those at that time. So um, now that you've concluded your opening remarks, I'll take questions. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, on the overall picture of Basically, commissioning and delivering uh, projects in Northern Ireland. 
Uh, would, would you agree that the system is, as a whole is not fit for purpose and actually works against the best endeavours to deliver? I certainly would agree that there is much room for improvement, and I think with the report that we have in front of us, it's, it's hard to disagree with that. Um, but I'm also very conscious that the area in which I work and in which John works has a level of expertise and specialist knowledge, which is actually acknowledged in the report, was acknowledged in the FIB report and was acknowledged in the 2013 um, CBI report. So that gives me a, an interesting perspective from this department compared to working in other previous departments where capital projects were maybe much less frequently having to be dealt with and managed. Um, we do have a huge amount of, of very professional and well-qualified expertise. We have economies of scale. We have three copes of our own in terms of the department itself, um, NI Water and TransLink. And the, I suppose the test for me would be the evidence about how moving and changing the approach would actually give us better results. Um, but I think any of us would have to be absolutely open to the, to the evidence. BGP is open far enough as to say that the system needs to be overhauled and reformed? I think with any system that looks at major projects, you would be a fool to say that there is, there, there is no scope for improving and doing things better. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, whether we can do things better collectively, and the report does go back into the 2013 um, recommendations about centralisation of, of construction procurement. Um, whether that's done in a massive centralisation programme or whether it's done actually in, in maybe a smaller number of centres of, of really specific expertise, I think it's the debate we should be having. Yeah. Just from an eight person's point, if you look in at the what's sitting on the table at the minute and what's been delivered and whatnot, it probably doesn't look great, but you'll be coming at it from a professional end of things and I do expect you to have a look at it from that end. On, on the planning on, on planning itself, uh, it appears that there there's some forty capital schemes in Northern Ireland currently waiting plan of permission. And around twenty around half of those have been waiting for more than five years for uh, some sort of approvals or refusals or, or whatever it's going to be. What, what would you say to that? I think behind every one of those, um, there is an individual story. Um, I know that behind every one of those, there is an individual story because um, I can tell you that I have looked very closely at very many of them. Um, but in terms of the, the, the general reasons for delay, um, there are a number of aspects, um, one of which is the legal challenge process, which I know you've been talking about already, uh, and in fact the subject of conversation um, back at the very start of, of the committee taking evidence on this. One of them, and, and again it was something that in a way you were touching on earlier, is around actually getting the pre-planning um, engagement Right, and it's something that um, we spend on, on, particularly on roads projects, but also on things like Belfast Rapid Transit. We spent a huge amount of time actually on the engagement side, and, and if it's helpful, John can set out how we do that on, on major themes. Um, but actually, if, if we can get the processes right, if we can get the engagement right, then we have a much better sense of where the concerns are um, and where the likelihood of challenges is. And the other thing I would have to mention in terms of public sector, planning projects is the, the funding, making sure that we have the certainty of funding. So if we well, lose opportunities at the minute, because obviously coming out of COVID, yeah. uh, we're going to be very keen and, and, and planning permissions being granted are going to be uh, absolutely crucial to the economy moving forward. So do you see things picking up in the next few months from trying to get more of these over the line as they were? Um, interesting, um, and we just published a, a set of performance stats just last week on planning, actually, which heartily shows quite a bit of improvement in terms of the length of time it takes for overall planning applications and for the major planning applications. <coughs> Regionally significant applications obviously come to the department and sit in the department, um, so I am very familiar with a number of the, the issues that um, we're dealing with in some of those. One of the things that I did initiate in coming into the department, um, and coincidentally it was John that led a piece of work for me, um, was a review actually to look at the role of statutory in the planning process. Because a lot of the feedback I was getting was that actually sometimes it was government departments themselves, including my own, that were slow to provide 
the input. Um, so one of the things I kicked off last year when I took up post was, was a review of the process of, of statutory consultation to see what the barriers were, what the issues were. Um, it was wearing a slightly different hat than he wears now, something that Dawn led, um, and it has given me a number of recommendations that I'm taking forward, one of which is actually the creation of a senior leader planning forum, which tries to make sure that there is visibility of those major applications. Um, but one of the other things that uh, the report that John led for me was really helpful in, in pointing out, and I think it's something we, we quite often miss in planning terms, is do you see planning as a process or do you see it actually as an enabler? And, and for me, there's something around planning as an enabler for shaping this place, how it looks, how it works, Absolutely. Um, and how its economy flourishes. And, and I wonder, have we for too long thought about it as a sort of linear process rather than as an enabler for, mm. for growth and well-being and the sort of aspirations we, we started to set out in the draft programme for government. What, what, what would you do in the instance of a consultee who has been dragging their feet? Uh, I, I know from obviously an elected member dealing with plan applications and representing folk, sometimes you need a big stick to get them to respond, but what would you normally do? in such a situation where you're basically pleading for a return of information? Um, I think actually the very first thing is, um, and the, the, the first thing that it struck me as important to do was actually to shine a light on it, to look, to make sure that we knew where things were. And, and one of the functions that the, the planning forum that I've established does now is, is have the visibility. There is nothing you know, like looking at something, and I know that's very obvious, but it doesn't mean that it's not true, knowing where major and significant applications are, and actually the people in charge of those areas at senior level knowing the reasons for delay. <coughs> now, sometimes we can't do anything about delay. Sometimes things are incredibly complex, and they do take time, and they take more resources than a government department or agency might have at that time. But actually, when we start to have the discussion in the debates about what needs to be done, how long might it take, and where is it now? That's been remarkably effective in, in giving people confidence, but also sending out a signal that this matters, this is important. And certainly for me, in a new department, that brought together um, planning with two statutory council fee rules. Um, the very obvious point that you can't know, really people to put out their housing order when you need to do so yourself. So, um, that was, that was for me a really be frustrating, but it must be frustrating from your own point of view as well. What was it? It's, um, I, I mean, I, I, it is, but I mean, imagine how it looks like if you're an applicant or if you're a person who's really concerned about an application. Or a businessman yep. prepared to put a large amount of money into yep. an area for the economy. So I am seeing um, a much greater recognition of the contribution of planning um, to economic and community development and seeing that through focusing on it, through trying to make sure that there is not just a long list somewhere but actually an understanding of what the potential of that list is. And, and it was something, John, your report really started to look at the value of planning for the first time possibly in a long time. Yes, yeah, so, so when I did the report, it was a sort of a short, sharp report uh, last spring, but I engaged with all the statutory consultees, the builders and the construction industry, just to, to take their minds and things. And you know, a, a couple of key things came out of it, and one of them is, for, for, for uh, investment purposes, planning is, is part of a kind of a critical path, and if it's held up, the whole investment process gets stymied. So that, that was recognised, and, and, and coming out of that, then there's, there's the need to have kind of ownership of outcomes and delivery on, on the statutory consultee side. Um, so, so that's important. And, and the other sort of key thing that came out of it was uh, and it links to you know, consultation and pre-application consultation and the quality of applications. So, uh, if a statutory consultee gets a quality application, there's a better chance of it going through. So, th there's an issue there about the perhaps the level of the bar for a valid application yeah. and the quality of application, and then encouraging, you know, for planning authorities and uh, applicants to deal with planning applications at pre-application stage and trying to do all the, the, the hard yards there, if you like, before the system, the application goes into the system. So, I know a lot of application, or applicants have tried that and yeah. have been successful to a certain degree, but it's still taken 
still a long time to go through this. So, you know about? Yeah, as Katrina <coughs> said, so hopefully my report shines a light on this. We've now got a, a forum of senior leaders uh, to try and take this forward. And you know, the, 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 the title of the report was to improve the responsiveness of statutory consultees in the planning process. They're one element of the planning process, but a very important element of it. So, you know, hopefully, we've you know we've taken cognizance of some of the general points you make and, and moved that on a bit. Well, thank you. And then moving on to finally to community engagement, uh, what, what could be done better on that front? Because obviously. Sometimes you can hit a wall when you don't expect it at some point in the future, and you think you're already over that hurdle. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the areas where you know there are huge lessons to be learned around understanding how things look like from different perspectives. So um, we have the perspective of an applicant, as you say, it could be um, it could be a public provider, it could be a business person with real ambitions for jobs and growth <coughs> in an area. Um, we also have the perspectives of those who live in the area, um, and it's actually understanding those and, and the sort of engagement that draws those out. But the other thing actually worth mentioning in that context is the, the, the local development planning process, because what that does is actually allow for a level of engagement at council level to set the vision um, for an area and to set the, <coughs> these are the priorities for us in we, this we area. Most the 11 councils have done that by now? They are in the process. They're, they're at various stages. Some of them are very far advanced, one or two waiting for public inquiry, um, some further down the track, but that's, you know, that, that's understandable. But that opportunity of actually your community plan and your local development plan and the conversation around what's our ambitions for this place, I think is a far more powerful conversation because then you can start to route development and applications into that wider vision. Um, but it's, it's also a critical issue on, on the road side and you know, in somewhere like the A5, for example, we've seen it very, very clearly and it's one of the reasons why you know, we, we've, we've had the challenges we've had, but we've adopted um, increasingly a very open response and John, in terms of setting absolutely everything out at every stage so that there shouldn't be surprises for people who are concerned or say, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. It, it um, used to be there was like a, a letter <coughs> drop went out to, say, yeah. is it 90 metres from the site or so, something along those lines. So just in, in terms of major road schemes generally, you know, uh, you start off with that preferred corridor uh, and then you get into different routes within the corridor. And generally what we would do is we'd be come up with a, some sort of public consultation letter drop. Uh, you take people's views and then you gradually refine the scheme down to your preferred route. And then it's the preferred route that then goes through the statutory processes. So certainly from the roads perspective, uh, there's a lot of engagement at the early stage to get, you know, you may have a red line, a green line, a yellow line, to try and get people's views and refine the scheme to, to get the best fit. You can't please all of the people all of the time, but if you can get to a point where you can get you know, uh, the best option, then you have a better chance of getting that through. Public event as well, potentially. Public events, absolutely. <coughs> Probably, you know, uh, at, at sort of preferred route stage, you know, you, you present your different coloured routes and take people's views, engage. So, so that's kind of for, for all major road schemes, it would be, and even actually for smaller minor work schemes, there would be a degree of public engagement. Is that just settled at that now, or is there something better you think you can do? Well, I, 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 never say never. You know, so we're always open to different ways of doing things, and I think. You know, it's back to what I said about planning. The more pre-application kind of consultation you have, the better chance you have of getting these, of getting things through, uh, and deliver. You know, th this is all about delivering on time and on budget. So, so I think you know, uh, 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 sharpening up uh, the the kind of consultation is, is probably something that we should always be focused on. I think there's, if you take something like Belfast Rapid Transit, for example. Um, completely different approach to community engagement really as part of, of the development of BRT1 because of the, the change that was being introduced because of the impact of things like the 12 hour bus lane. So a real requirement actually to do something different and actually to be out and talking to communities along that route. And it was interesting when we were closing that project down a, a month or two ago and we had the Gate 5 Gateway Review. Um, one of the things that the Gateway Reviewers commented on was actually the importance of that engagement and community engagement and, and in real terms, not just in sending out the, you know, the letter or the official government, you know, um, 
official statement, but something that actually talked to people about <coughs> what their fears were, what their concerns were, and how you would respond to them. And, and one of the things for us in that, hopefully, if, if as we move forward with DRT2, is actually how you build on that learning, um, how you take <coughs> it forward, and actually how we don't have to repeat the harder lessons of BRT1 because we've already learned them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and th um, thank you for your evidence uh, around this. Um, and I do agree with you that the issue around budgeting and having one year budget is, is, is not suboptimal, is probably the most diplomatic way to put it uh, in terms of being able to, to plan around that. And I do appreciate the efforts that are being made and the, as you've been saying, the lights are being shone. But I think we're in a very critical position here now, and the evidence is there that we're facing the worst economic recession in, in history. But yet we can borrow up to £200 million for capital funding. We're not borrowing a penny because we can't spend it. We surrendered capital funding at the end of last year because we weren't able to deliver projects. And we really, really need this investment to be able to drive um, jobs uh, and the creation of those. Um, and one of the issues is that when applications go through and you hear about an approval given, the next thing you're waiting for is a judicial review in Northern Ireland. And I just wanted to know what practically can be done to try to ensure that we're not having this, you know, inevitability that a judicial review will delay that application. I guess, from my perspective, um, without getting into commentary about the judicial review process, the best thing we can do actually is to make sure we follow processes and we do that pre-engagement. Now, the risk about that is that it does take us longer. We are more cautious. We are more risk averse because we know the stakes are high and we know that if we end up in a, in a, in a challenge situation, it will take time. And, and the A6 is a really good example of that because actually that's a challenge that um, the courts dismissed and the appeal was dismissed, but it still cost us at least a year and it still cost us at least £10 million in, um, you know, in, in costs for that project. So nothing is risk free, but for me actually, the three things are the engagement, uh, the, the making sure we're robust on our processes, but also the trying to make sure we are as up to date as we can on things that move very, very quickly, like the um, position in relation to environmental case law. So things change almost on a daily basis. We've seen that and you know, you don't even have to look locally. You can look at something like the third runway decision and actually then trying to pin back. What are the implications of that? Um, for us, what is the latest position on, on environmental case law? What do we need to do? Uh, and it is tricky. There is no, you know, there's no point in pretending that it isn't. But the only way I can think of of lowering the risk is actually to do the processing, to take the advice, and to make sure we're as up to date as possible in understanding, you know, what the latest position is. It's it does make us more cautious. There's no doubt about that, but um, we know the cost of delay when challenges do happen, and I would really rather that we got it right first time. Yeah, but I understand that, but the, the delays are quite significant. There's two applications sitting there for 13 years. Yep. You know, uh, it, it, to be honest, the, the, those scales of delays are scandalous. And, you know, whilst we're waiting for the legislation to pass, for, uh, in light of the Buick judgment for the Minister to take decisions. I, I don't know whether there's any confidence that once that legislation is passed, we will be able to, to get decisions and get, get through those applications. And the, the examples you put are actually examples of where decisions were taken and then opposed and then into a process of um, public inquiry. So in, in, in two of the examples that, that I know were in the, the question we answered recently for you, um, those actually weren't, the case, weren't cases of decisions not being taken. They were cases of what happened after the decision was taken. Is there a feeling that Northern Ireland is unique in this regard, or is it something that you feel is, is common across the UK? Because I know other jurisdictions would approach planning applications like this in a different manner. I, um, I mean, I, I, I do hear anecdotal feedback that sometimes the, the bar is perceived to be lower um, here than elsewhere. And certainly we've had some really good conversations with industry representative bodies, um, and some of them were with um, you and the other committee you sit on a couple of weeks ago talking about this. So there is, um, 
I know um, some work underway, uh, including from the audit office, to to look at the whole area of judicial review. Um, but for me, the only thing I can think of doing at the moment is trying to make sure that our processes are as watertight as they possibly can be, so that if a challenge comes, it doesn't have grounds. And see if the applications are saved. And I do agree with you that the standard of some applications need to be improved. From my time and. Council, you know, applications were coming in which weren't of a sufficient standard were then being delayed because there was a lot of work being done to try to, to make it into a situation where it was to be able to consider for approval. But once they come in, is there any consideration in terms of like for example processing agreements so that statutory consultees can get their responses back on time and we can get that over the line? Because I think the situation is once it comes into the system, we're just waiting on a wing and a prayer for the statutory consultees to come back to the response. And the difficulty is, is that particularly in these times now, we're needing these developments to proceed to enable economic growth, but they're being held up because of statutory consultees. The, um, I mean, and that is back to the, the point I, I, I started with earlier around looking very specifically at statutory consultees. At the moment, um, statutory consultees, unless they agree an extension, have a 21-day target. Um, the latest figure I have has um, improved from, um, I think the average now is about a 71% across all statutory consultees. Um, but you know, you will quickly point out that that's 29% <laughs> that aren't achieving it. Um, for you know, for for roads in my department, partly for me, um, it's improved um, this year by a couple of percentage points. But actually, I'm talking about a volume of um, something like 11 and a half thousand <laughs> individual planning applications coming into a part of my organisation that's 25% smaller than it was four years ago. So. Yes. There is a there is um, a focus and there is a leadership job to make sure that people understand the wider economic importance of some of these applications. There's also no doubt about it a capacity issue as well with that sort of volume. Just one last question, uh, Chair. Um, the whole issue of skills and capacity of the civil service to be able to do and it's been considered as it's been in a report uh, from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, but particularly around the sort of being able to get these infrastructure projects delivered has been a real, real issue. And it's been reported in previous reports about having a centralised body which would bring those skills together and which would deli drive delivery. Why haven't we seen that to date? You know, you know, we, we constantly we're hearing reports of very much silo working and departments working on their own projects, but there's not one centralised body. And you know, we're, we're, we're told that SIB are, are, are there to give that assistance, but the evidence that I've just outlined today doesn't exactly act as a great testimony in terms of the ability of the SIB to get delivery. Well, we have um, a significant amount of in-house expertise, more so than any other department yeah. that I've certainly worked in. So, um, one of the things I have done in, in reorganising things within the department is actually to bring together um, the major procurements in, in the directorate that John now heads up. So we have a major projects and procurements directorate with a specific focus. John can speak for himself, but John actually has been through the major projects leadership academy qualification, which is seen as the gold standard for um, project and program management. And we have a, a significant number of, of professionally qualified staff, um, including um, as you might expect from us, you know, quite significant numbers of chartered civil engineers who have project management at their core, but as well as that, a number of professionals in procurement. And John, you might want to say a wee bit more about that, but it is a point that I'm certainly um, very keen to, to look at how we do more on, and also how we share the expertise that we have. Um, one of the things I did myself was the training to be an accredited gateway reviewer. Um, small beer compared to the qualifications that John has, but actually the insight into that process carries with it a huge amount of learning for all of us. So that, that concept of continuous professional <coughs> development for any one of us, I think, has to be part of who we are and how we do things. So, so maybe just... And, and, and we can always continuously improve. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that's the first thing. You know, we're we're not a perfect organisation, uh, but you know, uh, the, the the bit of the department that I sort of manage is, is the Roads and Rivers Centre of Procurement Expertise. 
and, and our organisation has, has, has got a, a specialism in civil engineering. There's probably 900 professional and technical staff in the organisation. As Katrina said, there's about 100 chartered engineers. And as you work that down to project and programme management professionals, you know, we have a body of maybe 15 to 20 qualified people, and there's always more people coming through the system. So, you know, to have that, you know, when you look at it, it's referenced in the report, the, 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 uh, I can't remember the, the PGN number for, for programme delivery that um, uh, CPD produces guidance in this, and, and I think we try to align with that. There's a new DAO, 2 of 20, that's just come out. That actually sort of ups the ups the bar again. So, I think we are quite a professional organisation, and, and that I think it's recognised actually by the CBI and in the report that that all the three cops in the department, uh, you know, have have got a degree of specialism. But you know, we can still improve. Just just a, you know, uh, I've got a number here that might be helpful. So, over the last five years, for example, we've delivered 1.1 billion pounds of of contracts. So, so we're, we're quite a significant delivery organisation in terms of capital projects beyond the ones that are uh, referenced in the report. Um, Ms Flynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much for coming along today. Um, I just wanted to ask, my first question is in and around um, the it's not specific to the Casement Park project, I'm not asking you to address that, but um, with Casement and other major projects, the Department for Infrastructure roads um, can seem to take the longest time to respond to statutory consultee. So I was just wondering, is there a particular reason mm. for that, or is there an issue that's, that's causing that, that that could be addressed? Um, and then my second question is in and around the Belfast Transport Hub. Um, so I know that the original business case in June 2017 um, had assumed that the planning permission would be received by September 17, um, and then that application was then called in by the Department for Infrastructure um, because of its regional significance. Um, so th this delayed the, the planning permission um, being given until March 2019, and I was just wondering um, why did that planning decision um, take so long, and maybe just to touch on some of the comments that yourself and John have made earlier. I think that's dead interesting. The conversation that you were having around, you know, taking this different, um, this refreshed look at the purpose of the planning system, um, and you know, you were talking about, you know, looking at it more as an enabler than, and I think that that is really interesting because you do pick that up that when you hear about the planning process, it almost becomes a negative at the outset, and then does that have? A repercussion down the line um, for people in that process, and just as well, you have mentioned around the the BRT um, transport system. Um, and again, I'm from West Belfast, and I have to say the community engagement was was fantastic. And although even whenever that project was coming on site and was being launched, there was great engagement. The community were aware that it was happening. But it's just interesting from a commu this community planning and community engagement conversation that we're having because there was still a lot of anxiety and like you know a nervousness mm -hmm. because it was something new and it was a change. But I'm delighted to say from that project that came live, it has went down wonderfully with the constituents and it's extremely popular and successful. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I, starting with the, the transport hub, so they, you're quite right, the department called it in in 2017. Um, that was one of the decisions that actually we couldn't have taken for a period of time um, without ministers, but it was one that as soon as um, we could, it was actually one of the ones that I was responsible for taking um, once the um, EFAF Act was enacted to allow us to take decisions following the Buick appeal. So it was one that um, once we were in a position where somebody could take a decision, um, unfortunately in many ways it wasn't a democratically elected minister, it was a civil servant, but we were able to, to take that and you know, from my perspective it was taken as... as as appropriately quickly as as we could, and it is now on the ground. And if anybody's been passed, you'll start to see the first signs of the enabling works on the ground for something which 
you know, is, is actually an example of planning as an enabler, because that's not a bus station or a train station. That's a significant regeneration um, program for that part of the city, which is really, really powerful. Um, in terms of roads, the, the, the statutory consultee process, that was the, that, that was the point I was um, making earlier. So at the moment, um, the, um, the performance is, 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 has it gone up from 71% to 73%, um, still a quarter, more than a quarter that we're not doing on time. Um, but I know some of the applications are incredibly complex, and without speaking about anyone in particular, you know, when you're looking at a, a, trans, a, a transport assessment of 18,000 pages, um, as one example, um, that does give a sense of the amount of work that actually has to go into making sure that that's properly assessed, tested, considered, and feedback provided. So, you know, there are times like that where the size of the task, I think, in a in a way, helps explain the size of the time. But I I don't doubt that from the applicant's perspective, it must be hugely frustrating to have to, to wait. But I am determined to see an improvement in our performance. I do, as I've said before, take the view that we can't be the department responsible for planning and not be, you know, one of the not, and not also be one of the better performing <laughs> statutory consultees. So it is something that I have a very clear focus on um, at the moment. Um, BRT, you're absolutely right, and, and one of the things, and John will be the SRO for BRT too, if we hopefully get the green light for it, but one of the things will be capturing that, that learning. But I came into the department just as BRT1 was going live, and you know I know from the conversations we had, even about things like, you know if you can remember parking outside schools and how that would work with bus lanes, people had real concerns. But they've seen what was possible, um, and leaving aside obviously the, the challenges of the moment around COVID and, and public transport, we were able to show what was possible, and I think BRT2 will be much easier because people can see that it's good and it works and it actually is something that makes us look, for me there's something still about us looking a modern you know, forward-looking city when you see the, the glider coming through the city centre or, or heading out west or east. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Beggs. <clears throat> I'll go back to Mr. Hillage's original comments about the 40 large capital projects and 20 of which have been in with the department for more than five years. Can we have a list of them with a sort of a, a sense of where they are and, and the reason for this gross delay? Because that, that is quite... Uh, extraordinary. Uh, I think that would be useful. And I did pick up a comment at, right at the start, but you said that problems in procurement for large capital projects are not unique to Northern Ireland. Would you accept the scale of the problem may well be unique to Northern Ireland? In terms of procurement, I think if you look at, particularly in, in major roads procurement um, and major road construction projects, you will see challenges right across these islands. Um, and John, from our work that we do with um, Highways Agency and others, we see these time and time again. They take different forms. So, you know, one of the one of the roads I've been monitoring for, for other reasons, just watching the progress on um, has been the, you know, a couple of the roads in Scotland that I would be on from time to time and actually just listening to and looking at some of the problems they encountered and seeing that they are very close to some of the things we recognise ourselves around um, challenges, around um, coming across things that weren't necessarily expected. And I'm thinking, John, of some, not just the environmental, but some of the archaeological issues in the early days of some of the schemes. So there's probably, in terms of challenges, there's environmental challenges procurement challenges on the actual the tendering procedure, say, and then, as you mentioned before, the, the planning challenges. So, um, you know, it's it's not unique to here. It's, you know, I'm aware of other projects in the Republic of Ireland as well that are challenged, and, of course, in, 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 in Great Britain as well. So, well, uh, Would you accept that the industry, the construction industry, uh, and even development industry, if, uh, who wish to develop any large scale, their perception is that planning and development in Northern Ireland is more difficult than elsewhere? Yes, well, I, I heard the evidence from the CEF to the committee in March, and I recognise they said that. And I think the, the, other, the other thing they said was that, 
that uh, not all challenges are vexatious. So I think the point they were making there was you need to get, you know, you know government clients need to try and get it right first time. Uh, but yes, I sense their frustration. Um, uh, and right first time is, is what we strive to do. It's a difficult process, particularly, uh, you know, when you get into the, and, and, and particularly in, in procurement, when you get into the sort of the uh, very small legal details, it becomes, becomes quite difficult. And do you accept that delays, there's a cost to public purse, there's a cost to of loss of service, uh, there's a cost of loss of private developers who may not come, and a cost to our economy and jobs? Yeah, abs absolutely. And it's the same point I made about if you imagine a critical path and, and planning is in the middle of it and, and that's delayed, then you know investors who want to come will say we'll go elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I want to turn now to page 38 in your report. It's figure 3.2, which is quite revealing. It highlights um, many of the projects where there's been cost overruns. Um, there's been five with design changes and seven with scope changes. You know, I'm aware that once you start to change mid-project, it can be very expensive. You may, have a, you may have a contractor in place, and really that's his negotiating point at that stage. Secondly, the early design is wasted. So how can we ensure that, that we get the design and scope right at the early stage? Yeah, um, and just on, on that, I know I mean, the, the, the table that, that you mentioned, um, it does show the, the Castle Dawson stretch of the A6 as the DFI project that had that particular um, issue around design change. Um, might be worth picking that one up, John. So, so I think that's a very specific one about a junction mm -hmm. that, right. that maybe fell out of uh, some of the issues around the inquiry. So, but in general, um, uh, uh, you know, a road scheme is, is taken through various phases, and once we get through procurement to construction, uh, I, unless you get some very specific ground issue or something like that, generally I would say that you know we progress as, as we planned. So I think the one on the A6 was, was a rather specific one on a junction that had to be taken out of the process with specific planning permission. But, but, but take the critical care unit. It started off as a six-storey building and end up. 10 story with the helipad. I mean, that was yeah. huge change in design. All that early design was wasted. No, totally accept that. Although that's you know that, that's a building and that's for others maybe to comment on. But in terms of roads, uh, you know as, as we go through a process to get to a point where we go to procurement. Uh, I do accept though that, that there, there there can be changes after that. Uh, but generally, uh, you, you know, I would like to think that we. We don't have many of those. Again, that table shows five had tendering issues and five had legal issues. Why? Well, in, in terms of the legal issues, um, obviously we had the A5 um, and the A6, and, and they're well documented. Um, we didn't have on um, the the other projects, but the, the A5 is, is very well documented in the report. There's been a, a at least a couple of legal challenges. Um, on, uh, a number of years ago, one more recently. Um, the most recent one was in relation to um, whether or not the department actually should have taken the decision to move ahead with the vesting orders and, and the statutory processes. And it was one that, for me, having come into the department, the, the priority for me actually became to get it out of court because the advice I had was that we were not going to win it um, and to get it back to a position where a, a fresh decision could be taken and that's the um, that's a process that's now having completed its public inquiry stage and we're waiting for the independent inspectors report which we hope to get in the in the next couple of months. Um, the Randallstown or the, the A6 legal challenge um, again well documented in the report um, a legal challenge brought against the department which um, was um, not accepted by the court, who, and I think the judge said the department's actions in that case have been logical and rational, if I remember correctly. Um, case dismissed, appeal turned down, but as I said earlier, um, still cost in terms of delay. And in that one, a cost which is not which is not proportionate to the time taken because there, were, there was a particular issue there around the swans that you may remember and, and people who know the route may well remember that there's a part of the year where actually we had agreed under the um, environmental steps that we took that we wouldn't be doing any work in proximity to the protected site 
which meant that if you missed that window, John, if I'm correct, yeah. you missed actually a full year. Yeah, so just to come back to your point on that table, the scope change was the due to... Well, can I just say, it really may be better, in terms of, I want to try and keep to the COVID um, regulations here. If, if, if one person could answer questions... If, apologies. I, I'm happy to let you yeah, carry no, on, apologies. but from now on. The, the, the page 29 um, refers to an OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation Development Report, in 2016 middle number of recommendations. Amongst them was the need to clarify and harmonise the role of relevant stakeholders in the commissioning and delivering of major infrastructure projects. And earlier on in that section of the report, uh, I only really learned of how complex the process is at the moment. There's a procurement board, the strategic investment board, the Department of Finance has a role, the construction and procurement delivery has a role, and then there's the specialist scope centres. Do you accept that we have a bureaucratic system which is overly complicated, adding layers and costing money? The, um, the OECD report was interesting because um, what it focused in on very much was around um, the efficiency of process, as you say, but also the use of expertise. Um, from, from my perspective, and maybe it's because I'm a civil servant and... <laughs> things look straightforward to me that maybe don't to, to normal people. Um, the procurement board sets the policy, so it sets out what government's approach to procurement is. Um, but then actually the decisions on how to procure are set by centres of procurement excellence. Um, for me that is reasonably straightforward because um, for most of the procurement we do, we have one in the department and also one in TransLink and one in NI, NI Water that are fully accredited and recognised as centres of expertise. So it is possibly slightly more streamlined for me than it is for other departments. But there is no doubt that there is always room for, for improvement. Um, but I'm very conscious that some of those decisions are definitely decisions for ministers. Um, it's, it was proposed before the report references the process that went through, and there wasn't agreement to make some of the changes that were recommended. I have to say, I don't understand how all those different bodies interact on, on, on the process. I would like a, a more detailed explanation. I don't understand it, so I'm sure the public has difficulties. Um, I was going to say, just, just on, and John referenced it earlier, but actually there has been updated guidance um, that has come out very recently around um, best practice in, in project delivery, which does actually set out some new benchmarks that we're all working to to follow, which are designed to make sure there is a stronger focus, particularly on things like project and program management, but also on the responsibilities of the senior responsible owner as well. So there are great efforts being made to make sure that best practice is captured and communicated, and then it falls to, to people like me to make sure then that it's taken and embedded within a department. Finally then, uh, on the issue of judicial reviews, um I have heard it said um, from, from some of those involved in, in the industry and projects that there can be even vexatious uh, judicious reviews from unsuccessful competitors just as a delaying blocking mechanism at very limited cost to those doing it given the scale of the project and that in GB legislation has changed so that those who might do something like that might suffer some of the cost to the public purse and the cost of loss of public service so that they could be eliminated if our legislation was updated. What do you say to that? I think that's entirely a matter for ministers <coughs> and the court system. It's, I mean, I have to work within the legislative arrangements and the judicial arrangements that apply. Um, it is something that I know others are, looked at, are looking at. I know the audit office is, is looking at the threshold for judicial review. You're right, they're different elsewhere. So in England, as I understand it, actually the costs may be linked to the potential costs awarded as a result of the outcome of the, of the review. Um, here it's not that. But I think it would be wrong for me to comment on something that's not part of my responsibilities, and that is something I know that has to be dealt with at, at both a political and a judicial level. Thank you. Hello. To be fair, a number of months ago was your responsibility. So, really, I think the, the, the question there is. You've confused me now, Chair. Well, we didn't have ministers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you so so you made the point that you'd made the decision about the Belfast yep. hub. Mm -hmm. So yep. what was your? So I think to be fair, if you back in time, 
You might be able to answer that question. Uh, but I wouldn't have been at that point. I mean, I, I, my department does not have any remit in terms of determining how the judicial process works. No, no. no so I don't in think terms of the planning process, absolutely, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And, and I know a lot of the questions have been asked. Um, it's just come back to the Audit Office report. I mean, plan is one of the major factors in it in terms of Obviously, delays lead to costs. You have to admit to that, Katrina. I mean, if you, use, if you use the casement example we were just talking about, I mean, you have serious costs now in relation to it. But I just want to go back. Obviously, there's going to be a review of the plan and now, and I don't think it is robust. And, and all the things that members have mentioned, the, the pre-application discussions have worked in some cases. But, but, it, but what people will say to you, it's only a discussion and until you put a plan in place. Then we shall see. So, in terms of making that more robust, how are we going to make that process more robust? I, I think community engagement is at the heart of most. Even you look at the big projects, A5, A6, all of those things, if you don't have early engagement, is how you start, is how you'll finish. And we need to put that in a robust mechanism and a strategy or a plan or whatever way you want to do it. Um, that needs to be first and foremost in, in what we're going to put together. So I'd just like your comments in relation to that, please. Yeah, and I, I couldn't disagree with that at all. I think we all know that if we have the right conversations at the start of a project, you get a better outcome. Um, Dawn mentioned earlier one of the challenges um, that there is around the quality of some applications, but I think you can't divorce those two things. So if you have a conversation about what you're planning, you have an opportunity to hear what people think, what their concerns are, and then you have an opportunity to, to develop the application so that it responds to those concerns. I suppose in the, in the round, I mean, we are, we are dealing with a planning system. We had a planning system for 40 years. We're now dealing with a planning system which is what, just, just over four years old. So we are still, you know, I, it's fair to say we're still finding our, our way through the planning system that we now have um, in its early stages. But there is, um, you know, the, to be fair, particularly to councils where the, the vast majority of applications go, we are seeing um, very significant improvements. So in the last four years, the, the processing time has come down quite significantly. Still plenty of room for improvement, but it is getting there. And one of the things we um, do and we, we publish it every year, is actually a new monitoring framework which gives us information about um, how applications are being decided at Northern Ireland level and within every single council. And that provides actually for a much more informed conversation around learning lessons. So who's doing this really well? Um, what are they doing? And how can that be built into how other people do it? So some of the engagement we've had with the chief executives of local councils and indeed with NILGA, has been really effective in, in trying to find ways of, of providing learning and development, but actually sharing good practice as well and, and letting people see examples of some, something that works well and trying to encourage that to be the way we do things more generally. No, I, I agree with that, and I think, but the process is the first starting point. Yeah. I, I just want to move on to a couple of quick points because you mentioned area plans, local council area plans. Unless they marry up with the regional development strategy, <clears throat> we're not going anywhere with it. So, and I know they're going through the process themselves, mm -hmm. and they're presenting as recommendations. But looking at the 40, and there's 40 large capital schemes. If you look at it, past, present, and future, how we set a process in place, one to deliver what's in the past, mm -hmm. and it may not be. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know the schemes. But I, I think that the the, develop, the area plans and development strategy has to marry up. And I'm only talking about the planning. Yep. I'm not even going to get into the procurement process, which was in the audit, and how we do that. And the other point I just want to make is because it brings me back to a drum, clay, cranog. A lot of members might not have heard about this, but it was found over in Inniskillen when they're doing one of, and it's an archaeological site. It's I know a thousand years old or maybe more, and. We have maps dating back, and this, this is my key point, because as one of your cons, uh, the statute consultees, um, certainly NAA in the past, and I'm not picking on them, there's, there's more, but as a statute consultee, sometimes people have been late in reporting. We have all that data, dating the maps come back to the 1800s, mm -hmm. and it was clearly identified, but still 
there was an error there in terms of that. I'm only using that as an example because it comes out it came out in one of the reports. So we have all the data, and what I'm saying is, my well, key point is, the statutory consultees, they have a period of time, they have the data on the database now and should be able to make an informed decision quicker. And, and that, that certainly would lead to, to the process, and I hope that's added in to the process when we do, when we do the review. And Chair, just one final point, if I may, the back to the plans, the water and sewage issues. There's no point in... Uh, allowing a, a development of 20, 40, 50, 100 houses when you don't marry up the, the treatment, the sewage treatments or whatever, whatever infrastructure is in place there. So uh, as a review of the plan and process, we, we certainly have to look up at all of that. Well, Thank you, Chair. And that, I mean, picking up on that final point, I know that's a real concern to councils as part of that local development planning process, because quite rightly, and if, if, if I look at, at the conversations I've had with chief executives, they have real ambitions for their areas for growing, for jobs, for houses, um, and we do not have the wherewithal to be able to provide the water and sewerage infrastructure that they need, and it's such a, a frustration because we know the level of investment that's needed. We're heading into a price control period um, from 2021, um, having come through one that will come to an end in 2021, where I think the, the amount we've provided from memory is around for that period, 930 million. Um, we reckon, NI Water reckons, um, and this is being tested at the moment by the regulator, but we reckon the amount needed for the next period is more than twice that amount. Um, and that's really to make sure that we continue to have something that, as some of us were talking about earlier, we tend to take for granted because it's, it's under the ground. So it, it's, it's a huge concern for me. Um, in terms of how this place works and how its infrastructure functions. And uh, something that we perhaps haven't had until relatively recently the sort of debate on, possibly because it wasn't manifesting itself as a problem, but it certainly now is. And there are, you know, a hundred odd places across Northern Ireland where there is constraint on development and, and you will all have, or most of you will have some of them in your constituencies. Uh, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. Thanks um, both for um, for the evidence. Just a couple of quick points. Um, you um, talk about the, the NAIO <coughs> report talks about it. You've mentioned it. Um, Multi-year budgeting and the fact that budgeting here is so short-term, presenting a problem. Can you outline a couple of examples where that's been a problem and why? Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and in a reverse way. I can talk about some of the flagships actually to make the point that when we know we have five years certainty, it allows us to take decisions in a, in a decent horizon. Um, if we're talking about major capital projects, quite often we're not talking about just the very, very big things, but I'm looking at a capital budget um, that actually invests in the assets that we already have. If I know over a five year period how much that budget is, there's a completely different approach you would take to planning. Um, of how you spend that money that would actually give you much, I'm convinced of it, and I think the evidence bears me out, better value for money, because we would have certainty, we would know that we were starting something that we had the work of all to complete, and we would be able to phase and manage things in a, in a much more um, effective way. And, and I think we'll have an early opportunity to test some of that with the approach being taken to the city deal project. So the, the city deals um, and the growth deals will have a capital budget for a period of between 10 to 15 years. And, and between all of us in central government and the councils, we'll have to plan an approach to those capital projects so that they're affordable within that period. But it will give certainty to the projects that are part of those city deals. And I think we'll see a, a different and a much more considered approach to their planning as a result. But it is, you know, for something like water and sewerage, we're you know, the next price control is seven years, but you're actually looking 40 or 50 years ahead. And not knowing what next year's budget is like is, um, for capital investment that's going to last a generation, hugely frustrating. Do you think that has, uh, would you say, I'm slightly asking you to editorialise beyond your role, but you're a very senior civil servant. Would you say that um, is in any way linked to the um, uh, sort of general capital underspend we have, where we have a particular issue with financial transactions capital, um, which is a slightly different type of money. It's financing rather than um, good for public spending. But do you think 
you think that's a challenge for you for you as a perm sec in terms of um, getting money out the door as it were um, I'm, I'm in the happy position of um, having spent my capital budget last year yeah. and having spent anything that came my way that others couldn't spend um, um, and actually it, it's, it's, it's a point worth making that actually you know a lot of the jobs in economic growth aren't confined to those very, very big projects. So um, simple investments in our road, in our structural maintenance of our roads and in our water and sewerage system actually has a huge multiplier effect in terms of jobs. So the more I get and the more I have certainty on what I can get, the more chance I have of spending it effectively. And, and the other very obvious point there is for, for us is knowing things at the start of the year. So even in a, even in a, in a single year budget, the more certain day I have at the start of the year, because the very obvious reason we make much most progress in the summer, yep. when the nights are long and the weather's a bit decent, a bit more decent. So the more I can start planning from the start of the financial year and not be reliant entirely on you know money coming right. in the year, the better value for money we can get. And you know, John, it's something you've much more experience than than me in. So at, a, at a very simple level, you know, we, we do very small schemes, local transport and safety measure schemes. That, but if they span two financial years, that you, you, you can't start them because you've no certainty going forward. So at a very simple level, multi-year budgets allows you to program and put things on a critical path. And another, you know, uh, just a, another bigger example, you know, so for example, the A5 it was originally envisaged to be done uh, consecutively or, or in parallel in three sections. And, and that generates economies of scale. Now, if you break it down into phases, you, you potentially lose those. So, um, you know, there are economies by having certainty over a longer period of time. Okay. And um, have you had any discussions about um, uh, longer-term budgeting going forward? I know it's something the executive is looking at. Um, is that something you've discussed with the, the finance department? You would be, in a sense, the, the, the department who would, as you say, benefit most. There would be a multiplier effect for you as a department in terms of having access to multi-year budgeting, and there's going to be a spending review later this year. I don't know if the finance department have approached you and asked you. Well, I've, we, we've had several conversations with the colleagues in, in the Department of Finance. I have to say they are very supportive. They see the logic. They see the rationale. Um, it's also a commitment in new decade, new approach, the, the idea of moving to multi-year budgets. And we do have a spending review at national level kicking off shortly, which I very much hope mm -hmm. Those go down the route of, of multi-year budgets, perhaps slightly longer for capital, I would say, even than from, for resource, because of the points we've, we've just made. Um, and there's also, you know, as, as we're heading into recovery, at the start of this year, and this was pre-COVID, the, the CVI had made the point that, you know, for every pound invested in infrastructure, it's got £2.92 worth of value. So, you know, you have, I have that sense of a capital budget of the order of half a billion pounds the economic impact we could be having, um, and we will have with that, and then the opportunity for a longer-term budget, better planned, would give us, you know, would give us even more economic potential. One, just further on that, and very brief, thank you, chairs. Just on um, the some of the UK government has done. I, I don't know how much work has got certainly when I was still at the Treasury. It was when they st started publishing these documents on infrastructure, infrastructure plans and pipelines in order to, um, some of it is a communications device, but that's not an, that doesn't mean it's a bad idea because it gives the market and the construction industry and everyone else a kind of sense of what's coming. H has we given any thought to doing that locally here, publishing a specific infrastructure plan or document that that well, separates it out from other, you know, there is a political and, and present, presentational issue sometimes with the, it, Infrastructure development, do you see what I mean, being kind of completed with other sort of resource pressures? Um, yeah, um, and one of the, the obvious starting points for that would be the, um, the investment strategy. So, when we were working um, on the suite of documents back in 2016 around the new approach to the programme for government, we knew it would be underpinned not just by a budget, yep. but actually by an investment strategy. And, and one of the things I remain very keen to, to see is an investment strategy that isn't actually just a list of projects, yeah. but actually <laughs> talks about investing in the infrastructure we already have and sets out you know, a, a, a balance around what is it we need to invest 
to maintain what we already own and we own you know what is john about 40 billion pounds worth of so, infrastructure assets so, so they, that we aren't maintaining to the right standard that's the number 40 billion is the number that aren't being maintained to the right standard or is that the total that's number the value of the assets the value of the assets around it's around 30 billion around actually 30 so billion. Sorry, that, just, that's the value of the road look. asset that's your fixed assets in the department in the department basically and you know so on, a, and on something like structural maintenance of the road network we should be spent around 145 million a year in a good year we're spending 75 this year last year um but actually something like that that means that the, you, your, your asset is still deteriorating which at some point means you're going to have to put more into actually patching it up and repairing and the real frustration for me is that quite often that means that i have to fund it from resource budgets because of the nature of some of the repairs um they come out of resource when actually if you'd had a, a more effective planning regime financial planning regime for maintenance we could have you know it's the stitch in time saves nine stuff okay, mr harvey okay thank you chair thank you katrina and john it's great to have you with us now, my question is on the A6. Okay, the 11 million legal challenge. Obviously, at consultation stage, this was not an issue with these swans. Uh, this piece of road from Randallstown to Castle Dawson, I'm not sure how long it is in miles. But maybe you could give us a breakdown on the, the 11 million cost. Um, and as well as that, maybe you could tell me if any of the works to date had any impact on this one. Yep. John, I'll let you go through the detail on that one, but we do have a breakdown. Some of it I summarised in the letter to the Chair, but it might be helpful for John to go into more detail. Very simply, so it's 10.6 million delay, and 8.6 of that is on the delay to the contractual target. It's a target cost contract, and in that particular uh, because of the so uh, the scheme is ready to go on, on in uh, 16 uh, August October 16 and uh, uh, that, that's when the the uh, judicial review was taken that delayed it until June uh, of the next year uh, and then uh, there was a, f a further delay because we lost the winter period uh, where works are, aren't permitted on the. Uh, uh, Tomb to Castle Dawson, uh, Tomb to Castle Dawson section. Um, so, so there's 8.6 of contractual costs, and then on top of that, uh, there are uh, two million in basically consulting engineering fees uh, uh, and DSO costs. So, um, uh, quite a, a significant cost in a project that is about 100, let me say 189 million. So, it's it's a big number, and as one of the members said earlier, you can do a lot with a number like that. And, um, in terms of the of, of has it had any impact? Um, anecdotally and, and from what people tell me from the site, I I, I don't believe it is. But you know, we we carry out surveys and you know facts will back that up. So that's just uh, I, I'm not I don't have the detail on that. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, when we do the the post project evaluation, that will be a factor uh, just to confirm whether there has or not been. So really, like that 11 million, the job still went ahead, and there was no swans are still fine. So it was a waste, really. Like, well, it was a cost of a delay. Yeah, yeah. And 8.6. That was the cost of the delay in itself, just because it had to stop. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a. If, if you imagine. Uh, 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 we have a, a, a contractual target, uh, and the contractor's got a work program, and he has to shuffle it around, and, and, and that, that's what the impact of the cost is. So, uh, you know, losing a winter was a big element of that. Okay. 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 Can I just ask? <clears throat> when I chair the infrastructure committee, I, I chair a um, planning conference. What struck me was the differential and the variance between the eleven councils in Northern Ireland in terms of planning. How can that how can that be the case? How, can, how do we get it standardised? And they were all boasting that they were the best and whoever was the worst and whatever. I'll not name them. Fear of embarrassment to those. But how do we get that standardised? I guess actually the question in that is um 
you know, what's the right level of standardization when the decision was taken to delegate? Um, so putting planning deliberately out to 11 local areas um, is inevitably going to provide differences of approach because councils will have different ways of doing them um, and they will have elected representatives, as you know, will, will, will have very clear views on what good looks like. Um, so difference, actually, in a way, we shouldn't be surprised at because going from 40 years of a single system to, you know, four coming up for five years of, of, of a delegated system is going to throw that up. I think the key thing, actually, for me is around um, the sharing of learning. So do we want everybody to be the same? Arguably not, or else the Assembly wouldn't have decided to delegate planning. Um, do we want there to be a way of sharing good practice? Absolutely, yes. And that's where things like the, the planning monitoring framework, I think, are, are really, really helpful because they don't, and I would always say, you know, data doesn't give you any answers, but it does give you some cracker questions to ask about when things look different in different council areas, why is that, um, and what, where, where does the good lie? So one of the things we've done, um, we've done a lot of work on, and I have to say Nilga and, and Solace have been really, really supportive, is that sort of sense of how do we bring people together more often? So, so and that leads me on to my question. So do you bring the 11 chief executives in and talk to Solace and say, how do we standardise this? How do we get better? Because yeah, 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 there can be a difference, and I get the point you're making. Mm -hmm. But it, but it, they can't. There can't be the difference in terms of the, some of the experiences that I witnessed that day in terms of something being more aesthetically pleasing in one part of the country to another. Yeah, and that is something that we are picking up. And we we put a huge amount of effort into, and, and the chief planner meets very, very regularly with okay. the heads of planning and all councils and. I've had the benefit of several conversations with council chief executives. There is still, I, I don't think we could get away from the fact that people are still learning how to operate in a system that is still in, you know, yeah. relatively new. But I mean, I take the point that. No, I, I get that. But uh, my concern is, and I think other members have made, raised the point, is the cost and the opportunity cost of these things not being processed as quickly as possible. Yeah. That's the point. But I think and quite often, pub point. public money, taxpayer and ratepayers' money, that that is being wasted. Um, you mentioned Katrina Service Leaders Planning Forum. Uh, yeah. this is something you've established. I think you said, um, how will that benefit, and what will it do? Um, it's the the statutory consultees. It's the the departments and mm. the councils um, who have a statutory consultation rule. So really, my thinking on that was having those people coming together so that first of all, from a very simple perspective, you start to have conversations about the performance of statutory consultees. That in itself can have an impact because actually it moves things up people's agendas mm. and they start to think about it more. Um, trying to work out what the barriers are. Are there any that are common across all departments, which actually might be something that you know might be best dealt with across all departments? Are there any unique to individual departments um, that might be best dealt with within, it, within a department? But also that sort of sharing of expertise and trying to have conversations around for major economic and regionally and economically significant applications, making sure that actually the conversation is around, it was, it's, it was the point that you made earlier around you know, the loss of opportunity. So if we do not process these applications, and we're not taking a position on them, we're not saying they have to be approved or, or not approved, but actually the people who put the applications in deserve a quicker response. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of, uh, around the planning forum is, first of all, to take forward uh, a number of the points and the findings that um, came out of the work that John did for me, but also to start to have those conversations around how do you overcome barriers. Okay. Um, I think it will, you know, I've, I've seen in some areas some improvement this year over last year. I don't honestly think I could put that down to that forum just yet. I think it's too early, but I am hopeful that shining the light and having the discussions and getting people to think about the obstacles and the barriers and what, you know, what they are will help us in, in overcoming them. Okay. So the procurement board. Do we have a, pub, a private sector representative on it? We have a number of private sector representatives on, on the procurement board now. That was a decision taken by our previous finance minister. So in 
In normal circumstances, chaired by the Finance Minister, its membership comprises all of the, the permanent secretaries of, of the Northern Ireland departments, and it now includes seven um, external advisers, um, with very different, um, some of whom have very different pro are private sector expertise. So, in the current procurement board, one I know from a, a major construction company, one from a you know a social enterprise. So, different people with different experiences, and actually, really interesting to hear how they talk about the procurement process because. It looks very different if you're in a big multinational company or a big company than it might be if you're in a small um, two or three man or woman business trying to apply for government work. So, so, so we have a, is there a rep from the Construction Employers Federation on it? Uh, there is certainly. It, it, it's they did ask for that, I think, it, when, uh, when they, they came into our meeting some time ago with. Uh, uh, and we raised it, I think, with uh, the head of the civil service and Miss Miss Gray around that issue. Yeah, he thought there, that was eminently sensible to do that. There is certainly um, there is certainly one of the external members that I know has uh, is from a construction background. Whether or not that is a CEF rep, I honestly I, don't know. Perhaps could you clarify that because they, they were I very would keen that colleagues yeah. in DOF to, yeah. to clarify okay. that absolutely. Good. Um, can I ask you? Constituency issue, but it's a constituency issue that will affect the whole of Northern Ireland. It will affect hauliers. It will affect the ports, the airports, uh, and and movement of, of um, product to the mainland. York Street Interchange. Are we any closer to seeing development and progress on the ground? Yes, in fact, um, it was a discussion that we had in the infrastructure committee this morning with the the minister. Um, she is very committed to the the project. It is a commitment in new decade, new approach. Um, at the moment, there is a wee bit of work just being done to um, really for the minister to reassure herself that the project is future proofed. Yeah. Um, but I have no doubt that. She will be um, setting out her position on that very soon. Because obviously, and is very is very clearly committed. Obviously, that was money to, which. Uh, and I think it's somebody who who knows the area very well, knows exactly some yeah. of the issues. But I think that is something which my party obviously had secured in confidence and supply yep. in 2017, and we <coughs> haven't we haven't got any progress on that at all. Um, and uh, can I then just make one final point? And this I would say is. Aesthetically, when you come into this city, the first thing you see is the rise. And I'll give it its official name. I was in the committee in City Hall, whenever it was, whenever it was put in place, we agreed on it. Can I just say, um, can I make a plea? The rise needs cleaned, and the grass around the bottom of it needs cut, because that's the first thing people see when they're coming into Belfast, especially if they're coming up from Dublin and the airport, and it's not very attractive at the moment. Okay. Just make a wee plea to you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Can I just advise you both um, that um, thought of the press very, very quickly because yeah, we're very, uh, an area wasn't covered. Um, in, terms of, in terms of environmental legislation, in the report, it, we're advised that your department has told the other office um, that the interpretation by the courts. Of environmental legislation uh, is, is causing difficulties, uh, and in particular, that there needs to be uh, very current and comprehensive available at all time, which and this perpetuates the development cycle when interspersed with delays through legal challenge. So my question is: uh, are the, Is the guidance here of the courts different from elsewhere? Or is there a different interpretation in the legislation? Does the legislation need clarified? I think um, it's an area where, and, and in fact, if we look at something like the A5, you know, the lawyers would tell us we were making case law as we were working through this because of its complexity. But actually, the, the point being made in, in the report was actually about how current environmental information has to be. It has to be up to date. And one of the risks we face is that if there is a delay for any other reason, then quite often you have to revisit and redo your environmental information to make sure that it's up to date. I think it has to have a currency, John, for around six, six months. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly the point. Is that the same elsewhere? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. But that's the challenge. So if you get held up for anything else, you might have had all of your environmental assessment done, and then you might have to redo it. Yeah. 
a lot. Okay. Thank you both very much. And thank, uh, you very much. thank you for your time and for your, your answers. And wish you both a very happy summer when it comes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can I just say to you, when you're leaving the building, uh, the, the, all the main uh, axes, including the front re revolving door, are closed. That's so down the ramp. So you're down the slope. Yep. Right. Yep. Hope it's not slippery. <laughs> I um, hope not, sure. And, uh, but <laughs> someone will just make sure you, if you're not sure how to get to it, that you find it safely. Thank okay. you. Okay, members. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, for the remaining items of business, we. Uh, have agreed earlier that we will remain in closed session. So if we could go into closed session now. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland 